happy hour time on the geek buddies here we go yo wow, that was that was that was uh smooth <laughs> did you like that what's up happy everyone hour. happy hour on the geek buddies by john roca <laughs> Welcome. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, special live episode of the Geek Buddies tonight here on a Friday night. Uh, at least where we're at a Friday night here entering. Friday night. The- it's sunny out. What are you talking about? Oh, that's right. Sorry. Afternoon happy hour heading into the evening. We are here to have a fun conversation on the Geek Buddies to talk about all the things going on in the week of Geek and to hear from all of you as well. Um, but let's introduce ourselves first. I am the outlaw John Roker, writer, producer, and host here on the Geek Buddies. I am Michael Vogel. I'm a writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies, and you can see some of my work right now on Netflix and YouTube with Strawberry Shortcake, Barry and the Big City. Shorts are on YouTube. Shorts are on Netflix. And the CG specials are on Netflix with the third special, Strawberry Spring Adventure, coming out in just a few days. Wow! You've got another special coming out. That's incredible. That's right. right. Well, I mean, there's four seasons, John. There is. There's four I've seasons heard. in the year. And we got, a season for, we got a season for every special and a special for every season. Gotta love it. Well, we are drinking tonight. I got my Knob Creek. I got my Coke Zero because I'm a bitch and I use chasers. Uh, And we are going to relax and open the doors, the Geek uh, Geek Bay doors, Geek Buddies Bay doors, and have a fun conversation talking about all things going on in the world. If you guys have questions, thoughts, or comments, you can send them in through Streamlabs and Super Chats. We might also pull some of your questions out of the regular chat for us yeah, to have a conversation tell you what, we got our topics today but i'm gonna tell you what it's a happy hour it's a friday yeah. i'm going on vacation monday for a couple of weeks you won't see me i'm gonna be off yeah. in japan and uh so hey whatever geeky stuff you want to talk about yeah lay it on us let's just wide open wide open guys let's talk yeah. about geek stuff today yeah and as you're coming into the show please remember to like the app hit the like button on it if you haven't subscribed to the channel subscribe to the channel if you're watching later leave comments down below on the stuff we're talking about here uh, but that's how that's how we're doing things. But Michael, you're talking about you're going to Japan ten days. Uh, what's the reason for this uh, going to Japan? What's going on? You here? know what's funny? The the actual reason is the yeah. it is a very geeky reason. I've Please. been to Japan twice, both times for work uh, with yes. Hasbro. Uh, once to tour Animation Studios and once to work on the first season of Transformers Prime with Polygon oh, yes. Animation. Um, but both times, I only had a couple days to sightsee, and since I only had a couple days to sightsee. I didn't go to Tokyo Disneyland because I was like, I've never been to Japan. I want to actually see Tokyo. So I walked, I like, you know, explored the city and like did the touristy things there. Yeah. But I'm a Disney nerd and I've always wanted to go. So I was talking to our fellow buddy, Brian Leonard, and yeah. I said, I really just wanted to, you know, I want to knock all the international Disney parks off my list at some point. And Tokyo Disney and Tokyo Disney Sea were at the top of the list. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And then I was like, look, let's just fly in, do Disney and fly out. I'm good. And he was like, well, if we're flying all the way over, yeah, eh, spend some more time. So we are doing it all. We're going to go. We're going to spend uh, our first few nights at the Tokyo Disneyland Hotel, do Tokyo Disney and Tokyo Disney Sea. Then we're going to go to Kyoto for a couple days. And then we're going to spend the rest of our time in Tokyo. And we have a uh, packed plan. Going to go to the Miyazaki Museum. Going to do all the fun stuff. So... I will have lots of photos and uh, lots of stories to tell you upon my return. Well, the question with well, that, first of all, I'm looking forward to that. Second of all, my question for you is what brought about this desire to go to Japan now? Like now at this particular stage of your life, is it because you've got a little bit of break in between projects and you guys just decided this is, and do you have this, have you done this through a travel planner or are you guys just kind of writing stuff down? You're like, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. How are you handling the Japan trip? Oh yeah, I didn't know we were going to do a full interview on this. this well, listen, this is asking for a first few minutes uh, just to warm no, up. No, you know, well, so, well, one thing is, uh, you know, one of the things, this is actually, I was just telling this story the other day. Mm. One of the things that's interesting is when I was working at Hasbro and when I was working at Sony and when I was working as an executive, yeah. you end up, do you do end up getting to take a lot of work trips. So I yeah. took work trips to New York and work trips to Japan and work trips to all these different places. And then when I made the jump over to writer, producer, showrunner, even though there's still work trips to like Vancouver to go up to Wild Brain in some places, yeah. I wasn't going going as many places and i realized i'm not that good at planning just a trip to go somewhere i'm used to someone saying hey we're gonna send you here and i'm like great i'm gonna go and so over the past few years i've kind of uh made it a point to do some type of international travel at least once a year so like three years ago uh a friend of mine turned 40 and wanted to go to madrid with 15 of his closest gay friends and i got to be one of them so i went to madrid for 10 days and then last year i went to new zealand and uh, did all the fun hobbity things and so this year's japan and so i do think like 
every year around March, April, uh, I'd like to just do a international trip. And no, did not plan it with any kind of planner. You just text and email a lot of friends and say, where should we stay and what do we do? And my sister had just gone to Japan. So nice. you get a lot of advice. And I will say, uh, because he will probably listen to this at some point, yeah. I will give Brian Leonard a lot of the credit because he hey. did most of the planning here. Now I'm I'm gonna earn I'm gonna earn my space on this trip, I think, when we get to Disney, because I have been studying YouTube and reading lots of things about strategizing how to do Tokyo Disney and Tokyo Disney Sea. So hopefully yeah. I earned my keep on that front, but he did the majority of the planning. Will this um, mean that you've gone to every Disney park in your oh, life? No, no? not okay. yet. I still got to go to Shanghai. I still got to, I got, yeah. I mean, I've obviously been to Orlando, all yeah. the parks in Orlando and here, um, but Tokyo Disney and Tokyo Disney Sea are getting knocked off the list now, but still got Shanghai and uh, Hong Kong to knock oh. off the list at some point. Wow. I, I, I have been with you. Yes. Um, we did do, we did do Paris. Disneyland Paris. Yeah. Yeah. Which is still alive. I think, right. It's still a thing. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, doing well. I remember they used to have an Armageddon ride at Disneyland Paris and they put it in after we had gone, which is a fucking crime because I would have loved to have gone on the Armageddon ride in Disneyland Paris. So you're you're all the Armageddon ride I need. <laughs> Do you remember that morning? This is a good Geek Buddies story. There was okay. one morning. First, was cheers. Like, like, first cheers. First cheers. 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 Cheers, cheers, cheers to Geek Buddies. Cheers there to was a morning. What was that? Like six months ago? It was like six months ago. I woke up on a Sunday morning and I was a little bit hungover and I didn't want to watch something new. So I was like, yeah, what am I going to watch? And I put on Armageddon. Oh. And about 20 minutes or so in Armageddon, I texted John and Shannon and said, God, I love this movie. It's so bad, but I love it. And then John said, it's not bad. It's a great movie. And then yeah. he started it. And then Shannon, 10 minutes later, texts us with like a blueberry muffin and Armageddon on in the background. And I think the three of us just all laid on our couches and texted each other crying as we watched Armageddon. So if you want to know how geek buddies spend their Sunday morning, sometimes <laughs> there you go. Sometimes it works. Sometimes we're on the same wavelength, the universal wavelength for sure. And that film was worth it. God damn it. That film. Was Absolutely. Um, well, we got stuff to get into here. And as I, as uh, Mike and I both said, if you guys want to send in your questions, thoughts and comments and ask us any questions here as we're just kind of uh, relaxing, sitting back on this happy hour edition of uh, the geek buddies, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we do have a couple. Let me start off with one of these here. Clarence bell says, I am sending this early as a thank you for the effort to tell Shannon's dad jokes in his absence. I acknowledge it's oh. a tremendous sacrifice and I'd send more, but my Panamanian educator salary doesn't allow me to do so. Um, uh, Michael. You people need to stop encouraging him. <laughs> Although I did see, I just, I just forwarded it to him on Twitter. There is a star Wars book of dad jokes that just came out. Get which, out of here. No. If there, if there wasn't a more perfect present, for our for our absent <laughs> geek buddy, that is it. I'll I'll do my best to come up with some really bad jokes for all of you, since oh. I know how much you love it when Shannon does it. That's true. And uh, what is uh, Shannon is uh, out at a park somewhere? Where's Shannon at tonight? He's at WonderCon right now. He's at WonderCon. That's right with uh, Kalinowski. Shannon Ooh. McClung is a geek buddy out in the field covering WonderCon for us while we are not, and he will come back. And while I am in Japan, he will return next week and tell you guys all of the exciting geek things though. that he saw there. We should have had to do a live spot from from WonderCon, a little helicopter accident right above. Anyway, would, if it was Shannon, it would be a little helicopter. Oh, see, I don't understand why the poor guy. Uh, anyway, all right. Uh, let's see. I'd never let my children watch the orchestra. There's too much sex and violence. Ah, uh, get it? That's a good one. I like that one. Sex um, and violence. <laughs> can't get rid sex of them. Sex and violence. Thank you, Sharon, for the super sticker. You're amazing. Uh, and then we got one more that came through here from Anthony B. Now that Timothy Chalamet I signed a deal with Warner Brothers, do you think he will be offered a role in the DC Universe? And what character could you envision him as? Well, this is a great way to start the show. Chalamet's favorite film is The Dark Knight, so I think it could happen. Yeah, Mike, uh, it's a three-picture deal. I think he signed with Warner Brothers. Um, I've got the details here. Give me just a second. Uh, yeah, Chalamet, yeah, multi-year feature film. Actually, there's no years. It's multi-year feature film uh, to collaborate on future projects as a star producer. As part of the first look agreement, Chalamet can make movies elsewhere, but WB will get his first dibs on backing his potential project. So your thoughts on the question here. Do you do you like this idea of Warner Brothers being getting into business with Timothy Chalamet? Does this mean that he's locked in to do more Dune movies? And second, do you anticipate him maybe crossing over into the DC universe. Are we looking at our penguin 
in the DC universe. If we move out of Colin Farrell, that's the the Batman with Pattinson. But could he be the Penguin in the new DC universe? What are your thoughts? I mean, pr- probably wouldn't be my first choice, but okay. Uh, I mean, well, first, f- first, this is a, this is a great th- this is a no brainer for Warner Brothers. I mean, yeah. Wonka made a ton of money. Six hundred. Dune million. made a ton of oh. money. Dune is like a huge hit. Yeah. Is they're both Timothy Shalom? Like, like it's a no brainer. I. I I didn't think Wonka was the greatest movie. I thought it was very sweet. It didn't. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't hit my sweet tooth just right, but it was nice. Yeah. Um. But Timothy Chalamet as a young Wonka is a no-brainer. The movie did great. He's good. It it makes sense. And obviously, we're gonna get more Dune. Um. And so being in business with Timothy Chalamet, I mean, you know, most people coming out of Dune two seem to think that uh, you know, Austin Butler, uh, Zendaya. Florence Pugh and Timothy Chalamet are like the next generation of Hollywood. So being yeah. in business with him doesn't seem like a bad idea. Now, does that mean he'll jump over into the DCU? Maybe, you know, I. Yeah. Do we need to get I, a few more, a few good movies established first before he would consider it? What do you think? It's not even that. It's that I, it, I'm i not going to say that Marvel doesn't cast big names because mm. they obviously do. Yeah. But Marvel Marvel, you know, there's a certain tier, and I think Timothy Chalamet may have surpassed that tier at this point, if that Ooh. makes sense. Like, like he, he's so big that unless you're going to make him one of the big heroes, and I can't think off the top of my head who that would be, yeah. he kind of upsets the balance of an ensemble. So, you know, you, you'd have to have the exact right role, and there's not a DC character that, like, jumps out at me like, oh, shit, that's it. Mm-hmm. Like, could he play? And I don't think, I don't, I don't think that Timothy Chalamet is reps would want him to do this but yeah. if whoever they cast as batman is batman and there's going to be a damien who's a much younger robin yeah is timothy chalamet like a dick grayson or a tim drake maybe like i don't know like so there's definitely places that you could find for him but i don't know that it would be the top of his list to join the dcu or the top of guns list uh to bring him in but yeah never say never it could be interesting because, like, clearly the reason he's doing a this Dune situation is, A, it was originally pitched as one big movie, and then it was Denis who split it into two. And, and then you have, you're working with one of the great directors of our time at Denis Villeneuve, so it makes sense to come back from multiple films. I don't know that Timothy Chalamet necessarily strikes me as a guy who wants to get into a franchise and do multiple well, films. So the, uh, the up, villain... I mean- well, this brings up, and you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. This was on our list to talk to, but it kind of yeah. brings up what Anthony Mackie was talking about. Okay, it's been that. all over. You yeah. know, it's been all over the news, uh, all over Twitter this week, where he was just sort of comparing uh, other things that he's done. What's the NBC, the video game, the um, yeah, uh, Twisted Metal. Yes, Twisted Metal. Comparing his work on Twisted Metal to comparing his work in the MCU, and just kind of saying that the MCU, there's not there's not the level of creative freedom, meaning that like these characters have been established. Yes. Like, oh, right. like there's certain things you can do to surprise people, but like these characters are these characters. And so yeah. Timothy Chalamet has done his big franchise thing with Dune and with Wonka, because it's kind of wide open, like yeah. you can kind of do whatever you want with a Wonka, like wherever he goes, like we know where he ends up in the chocolate factory, but there's probably <laughs> several adventures he gets to have before Charlie Bucket shows up. So. Right. You know, you can you sort of can make it up as you go along. Whereas if he steps into the DCU and he's Jason Todd, like somebody said, if he's yeah. one of the Flashes, you know, whoever he might be, you're really like you're locked into this is who you're going to be, and what you get to do with that role is a lot more um, constrained. And if that's yeah. something that Timothy Chalamet is interested in, great. But you know, one of the reasons that a lot of actors come to Marvel is the exposure, and you get a really good solid paycheck for a few years. And I think he's already got those two parts covered. <laughs> Listen, yeah, I think you're 100% right on that front because looking at the box office numbers and they're predicting that Dune 2 will wind up with about 750 million worldwide, maybe 800 if it keeps having legs, but that's where it's topping out at. And Wonka passed over $600 million in its yeah. theatrical run. It's right, it's on HBO Max now or on Max, but that's almost, that's like $1.5 billion in two movies that he has made. So my man, and that's not to say, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to dog. Like, obviously, I'm not trying to dog on superhero movies. Sure. We, we love superhero movies here, yeah. but I think when you're an actor, mm. uh, so like, look, let, let's use Florence Pugh as an example. Like, sure, Florence Pugh, she's locked into Marvel. 
Like she is yes, in the big clearly. franchise. She yep. is. We'll talk about it because John still thinks the movie's not happening. But yeah, uh, but but Florence Pugh is locked into that, and yeah. as an actress, she then wants to go do other things. Yeah, she's in Dune, but like that's Denny Villeneuve, and he's an auteur. But like Florence Pugh is going to go do a bunch of smaller projects, or find yes. a director that she's really oh. passionate about, or find some book that she wants to adapt. And now she has the level of power to say, "I want to be a producer on this book, and this is a role that I really want to play." Right. She's got her big franchise. And Timothy Chalamet between Dune and Wonka already has two franchises on his plate. So in his spare time, does he want to go wear spandex and fight dark side? Right. Or does he want to do some really artsy small film? As an actor, he probably wants to do the artsy small film. Right, right. Well, I mean, let's let's make that uh, transition here. Let's take a look at I mean, Mike, is this real? I mean, uh, Yes, it's real. We're seeing you, your can I tell everybody, can I tell everybody trailer? about your batshit crazy texts this Hold week? On. Hold on, let's get to the story first, and then you can tell them about the magic. Now, first of all, she takes a shot. Uh, oh, she takes a shot. She shows her new outfit out. She looks great. She looks fantastic. It has pockets, of course, because Yelena needs pockets. We go inside the sound stage. Someone commented on the hot mic yesterday. You know it's a sound stage. Yes, Point Dexter. I know it's a fucking sound stage. But we see her. She meets the director, who uh, has a staged moment here, pretending as if he didn't know she was coming. Uh, and uh, and then she shows herself shooting a gun in that shot, and there's some sort of spherical object behind her there on screen. What is that exactly? And then we get a shot of some people, and basically she's saying, look forward to uh, you guys seeing Thunderbolts uh, looking for. So this is clearly possibly AI, and it's in incredible what they can do <laughs> what do you mean with AI, AI to make people look what like that. What are exactly. you talking about? Because... <laughs> This film, that film was never supposed to happen. I still don't believe it's happening. But yes. So I had multiple people send me this Thunderbolts video on both Twitter and Instagram and say, well, I guess Roca was wrong. It's happening now. And I will tell you what happened this week. John Roca, this, this, this video got texted onto a Geek Buddies text chain. Whoops. I guess oh. you're wrong. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> I said, Roka, I guess you're wrong. And Roka gave the most Roka answer. He said, he said, <laughs> well, I, I, I said that the original version of Thunderbolts that was pitched would never see the light of day. That, that was, <laughs> that was where Sebastian Stan was a lead and Red Hulk was in it and they've changed it. And now this is this new version. So this is going to happen. I never said a Thunderbolts movie wasn't going to happen. I said that version of Thunderbolts wasn't going to happen. And mm. we, uh pointed out that that was a Hayward Island level answer to the question. But uh, yes, John, I, I don't think that was AI. I think that was Florence Pugh on the set. The fool um, me once. Yes. I don't know. And in typical and in typical Marvel fashion, they love to play the, I'm not supposed to show you this, but I as the actor am breaking the rules, but that's not what's really happening here. But it's cute and it's fun. And yeah. yes, Thunderbolts is clearly happening. Well, I mean, yes, I, I tried to defend myself by saying that Thunderbolts movie is not happening because remember the Thunderbolts movie they originally pitched is David Harbor is is, sure, uh, is sure. David Harbor David Harbor still in it is Sebastian Stan he's saying he's, he's not in it. it he's saying he's not in it he said he's yeah, not in it. we'll see uh, oh no no he I'm sorry he's in it. Daniel Bruhl isn't in it so Zemo isn't is in it. he said he's not in it um uh, I haven't heard of Org Olga Kurilenko is still in it I don't know if she's still in it there's been no talk of Valentina still being in the movie maybe she's out but what I think is smart here and what I said they needed to do is to make it a Florence Pugh movie. Like she's leading the Thunderbolt. And so having her do the video, I think, is further proof that she will be the one that they are focused on because people love Yelena Belova. They loved her portrayal. And Florence Pugh is a goddamn great actress. So there's no reason all these other character actors should be trying to be the lead of this movie. It absolutely should be. Uh, Florence Pugh. So her doing the video makes me feel like that version of the Thunderbolts is going to happen. I'm much more confident than the original version, which uh -huh. was Suicide Squad in the Marvel Universe. I didn't think that film was going to happen. I mean, I think that it still is Suicide Squad in the Marvel Universe. Like, it's, like, like your 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 contention that this is some completely drastically different movie. <laughs> from what i've heard this is and i've heard this for a while now like the red hulk not being in it sure like they're moving all that over to brave new world yes but other than that this is sort of the 
group of government sanctioned superheroes that have been cobbled together in the absence of the Avengers. Yeah. And that the movie is really a Yelena Belova Valentina movie that it really is Florence Pugh and Julie Louise Dreyfus as sort of the, the, the two kind of leads in this movie that are butting heads is what I have heard. So oh, okay. if that's what happens yeah, and you still have everyone who's been rumored to be in it, ghost and, uh david harbour and sebastian stan and yeah. um what's her face from black widow okay, uh, yeah then you know yeah i think that that's basically gonna be the same movie but i'm excited i'm excited that it's happening again i am very and i think i'm not the only one mm -hmm. on this happy hour right now but i think we are all very uh excited anxious and a little nervous about the next few Marvel outings. I'm excited now because it seems to be clearly that she's going to be the lead of the movie. So I'm excited now for the movie. I was not excited with the original pitch, and I thought that was not a movie Marvel should do. This, there have been changes, casting changes, and so now I'm a little more excited to see this Thunderbolts movie and see where it's going to go. Um, what are the casting changes? Uh, well, we've well, well, we're moving certain characters to lower parts of the. It seems to be what we're hearing is lower. So, sec so and then Io Itabiri is out, unfortunately. Yes, Io Itabiri is out. So they bring up, brought in. Um, I think it was the actress from Blockers is coming in. I think, and so great, have her come in, be a part of this. This is fine, but like, I don't think I, I think this is going to be a different movie than what they originally pitched us, and there have been some changes as well to the overall film. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we're going to get. Um, I got to bring this up. CTV channel says, whatever, Roka, I can't stand people like this. We're having fun, CTV. Relax, man. It's okay, dude. Touch grass or, or talk to somebody. Relax. Have a drink with us, man. It's okay. We're all listen, just partying around, having fun. Listen, man. Okay. Listen, man. Yeah. I've been dealing with people like this <laughs> since my junior year of college, and Please. I'm still here. Ditto. I mean, ditto. I mean, ditto for God's sake. Yeah, Stephen Yoon. Steven Yoon yes, Steven Yoon. Yeah, Steven yeah. Yoon is gone Sentry's too. Sentry, out. Sentry's well, out. Io Itaberry's out. Yeah. But I do think that the movie is still sort of, I mean, not exactly, but it's going to be like the Marvel version of a Suicide Squad type thing. Like, this is definitely a group of people that are not the Avengers, yeah, yeah, yeah. but in a world where there aren't really Avengers. I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I, I, I try and remain excited, but yeah. I, I would have to say... And this is a wild statement as someone who is such a big Marvel fan and such a big Disney fan. When I look at 2025, I'm way more excited about the launch of the new DC universe than I am about what Marvel has coming out. Yeah. Yeah. If, that's I'm, being, a fair if point. I'm being honest, if I'm yeah. being honest. That's a fair point. Um, I didn't James Gunn shoot something down this week about the Amanda Waller series. I thought she, uh, he shot something down uh, some of the, some people were speculating about the Waller series, and I thought he shot something, but I'm looking for it right now. I don't, here it is. He debunks the Waller casting talk. Um, the rumor was that the Peacemaker spinoff series Waller starring Bella Davis uh, is rumored to have cast the last voyage of the Demeter, Kong Skull Island, and 24 Legacy actor Corey Hawkins as Agent Dale Gunn in the series, but uh, James Gunn shot down that talk, uh, saying that scripts aren't even finished yet. They haven't even started the casting process. Uh, and this rumor originated at medium.com. So, I mean, it's not a bad choice. I like this guy as an actor. I do like him a lot. I yeah. think he's a great actor. So if he shows up in it, uh, yeah. I won't be mad. Yeah, I agree. Let's move on to some more Marvel updates uh, uh, here, uh, Mike. The Spider-Man 4 is um, looking to shoot in September, October of this year. They still don't have a director locked down. Snyder speculated on his story a couple nights ago on the Insider that Justin Lin might be one of the considerations on the list. What are your thoughts on a Justin Lin Spider-Man 4 movie? And do you think we're going to get the big movie like Tom Rothman wants or the smaller ground-based movie like uh, Feige wants? Man, I really, <laughs> I really hope we get the small movie that Feige wants because that is 100% correct. Um, yeah. But if it's a Justin Lin movie, I don't know that it's going small. Yeah, I think if you cast if Justin Lin's your director, I can't imagine it's going small. I agree with you. He's gonna. So do you? I mean, I was watching some of No Way Home this morning, and I watched some of Tobey Maguire last night in Spider Man Three, 
just because I still occasionally, Why? I just still marvel at what a train wreck that movie is. Like I still watch BBS sometimes because such a train wreck. So my question is this, do you, don't we lose the allure of Spider-Man No Way Home if we bring back Toby and bring back Andrew? Doesn't yes. it doesn't it kind of lose its thing? Is that yes. the danger here? Yes. Yeah. Like it's just like just yes. Yeah. Like that is just that is a basic yes that like okay. this entire idea of that worked really well, audiences yeah. loved it, let's keep doing it. Yeah. Is not the thing like i don't need to see another movie where all three spider-men team up i saw it it was yeah. great you fucking killed it you did it mm -hmm. if you, uh, and honestly and given the mess that sony's in what the we don't want that yeah if you gave me a movie a standalone movie like a logan yeah with toby mcguire and yes. the older Spider-Man and cast Kirsten Dunst in it. And he, it. I, I could see their life and what has happened to them since Spider-Man 3. I think that's super interesting. Yeah. You want to show me an Andrew Garfield who comes back after his experience with the other Spider-Men and after sa saving MJ right. and going, I got to get my life back together. And he becomes a new Spider-Man and you run with him. Yes, I'm 100% interested in that figuring out another way for them to all come together in the multiverse and go, well, here we are again. It's another job for the Spider-Men. It's like, that is the most studio executive dumbass idea. <laughs> it, it Nobody wants it. Yeah. Like, no, you're right. Like it's not, that's not, and like, that's not to say that if the movie comes out, we're not all going to go see it and it will right. probably make money almost like see what, but it'll be like the Michael Bay Transformers movies where it's like, it's the law of diminishing returns. The more you do it, the less interested we get in it because we saw the thing. You did right. a thing that was really amazing. We all were really excited about it. Now give us the next thing. Yeah. And they're not doing that like that. If, if that's the road they go down. No, I agree with you hundred percent. And I, and I think that's, that's the danger of it all. And I don't know why you're listening. If you're at the front of the class getting hundreds and getting A's, why are you listening to the person in the back of the class about what to do with your project? That makes no sense. Like, I don't understand why Sony, why the MCU Marvel Disney would listen to Sony about any advice they have well, about Spider-Man with how they pissed away all their movies. Well, because Marvel doesn't have the rights to Spider-Man. I, I know, I know. You like, have to really, deal like, with it. It is yeah. a... As it is a very dysfunctional relationship because yeah. at the end of the day, Sony can take their Spider-Man toy and go home. Yes, true. Very Sony true. can say, fine, you don't get Spider-Man. So Marvel has to play nice because yeah. especially now, like there yeah. was a point where Marvel was like, we're killing it without Spider-Man. <laughs> and yeah. We'd like Spider-Man, but if you don't want to give us Spider-Man, screw you, we're going to keep doing it. But Marvel now is in like a, oh, we, we really need Spider-Man. So Marvel needs Sony. Sony understands that Marvel makes better movies than they do. Yes. Like behind closed doors. They might not say that, but they clearly understand that Marvel, even as challenged as they are right now still makes better movies than sony's making yeah aside from the animated spider-man movies um and so like it's a very dysfunctional relationship they both kind of need the other that's a shame and so they're gonna fight it out and probably end up somewhere in the middle it's like divorced parents having to parent co-parent the child they're like it is exactly like that, right <laughs> it just feels like you've got the asshole dad and you've got the doting mother and i've got to deal with it because you know the situation is the way it is let me ask you one more thing here. Um, I don't know if you saw this. Kristen Stewart has been doing the rounds for Love Lies Bleeding, which a lot of people say is a fantastic film. Her and Katie O'Brien. Shout out to Katie O'Brien, who has just been cast in Mission Possible 8. Um, for those of you who remember her from the uh, recent um, Andor season. And so uh, great to see. Uh, that. Uh, in wait, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Mandalorian season, I think she was in, right? Or was it the Ahsoka series that she was in? I forget. But it's great to see. Anyway, Star Wars series. Um, she was talking about this stuff about Marvel movies. Uh, and she said, um, about Jodie Foster, uh, recently, she recently said, it's a phase. It's a phase that's last a little too long for me, but it's a phase. And I've seen so many different phases. Hopefully people will be sick of it soon. The good ones like Iron Man and Black Panther, and the Matrix are Marvel at those movies and I'm swept up with the entertainment of it, but that's not why I became an actor and those movies don't change my life. Hopefully there'll be room for everything else. 
So Kristen Stewart was on the Not Skinny, Not Fat podcast. It's, wow, what a name. And she said she pretty much feels the same way as Jodie Foster. That, And she said, making a superhero movie, quote, sounds like a fucking nightmare, actually. I will likely never do a Marvel movie. If Greta asked me to do a Marvel movie, then I would do it. She said, I like big movies. So I, I'm, I'm surprised by this uh, response. This is someone who was in Snow White and the Huntsman. Someone who was in a Charlie's Angel reboot, and someone who's in what four to five episodes, uh, films of the Twilight franchise, and I get it. Now she's doing. To be it fair, America. she's been very clear that she did not love doing those Twilight <laughs> movies. Fine, but she still did them, and the people, the reason only people know her is because of the fucking Twilight movies. So I, I find that to be a bit sanctimonious to say that about Marvel movies and say that they're a machine. And she goes on to say further, like you can't feel any ownership of what you do acting wise in those films i think it's a bit of an insult to a lot of the really established and award-winning actors that are in the marvel universe i just find it odd to have this kind of snooty condescending look down my nose approach at film when you've been a part of three separate franchises uh that were trying to get off the ground so what do you think of these two? it's hard i mean i'll put it a different way i you know we're, we're dinging her for what she's saying but well, I a year ago, a year you you are digging her. I'm not. Yeah. Um, but a year or so ago, when Ben Affleck had that huge article around the time that Argo came out. Oh yes. It was really his tell-all article, and he talked about how he wanted to kill himself <laughs> doing fucking Justice League. That's true. And he was really clear. He's like, you know, yeah. like as an actor, you go on set, you wear this fucking spandex outfit. There's people with like fans fanning you down because you're so hot. You walk onto a set, you go, if we don't get the nuclear codes right now, Gotham will be destroyed. They say cut, they make you do it 10 more times. You can't move at all. And then they're like, okay, get off stage. The CG will take care of the rest of it. And I do understand as an actor, it's kind of what I was saying about the Timothy Chalamet thing. Like, I think there's a lot to be said for being in some of these franchises. And I think sure. what Marvel did in phases one, two, and three I think at that point, a lot of actors were like, I want to be in this Marvel universe. This is awesome. Like, this is something yeah. that hasn't happened in movies before. Right. But now where we're at this point where, like, Marvel's churning out superhero movies and we're not 100% excited about where they're at. We're like, we're, I don't know that we're ever going to hit that end game level. Oh, yeah. And I'm DC is sort of rebooting everything, but we don't know what it's going to be yet. Yeah. And Sony's making their Marvel spider-man universe without a spider-man movies and we all hate them yes it's like i i think that for an actor being in a superhero movie in a lot of ways can be a thankless task depending on who's directing it yeah. and depending on what the, the take is and there are definite reasons to be part of a big superhero universe but when everything is not working great do you really want to be in it like that like right now we're at that point where like yeah it's it's hard work and it's not always the most fun. And as an actor, it's not always the type of role that you can really sink your teeth into. And right. if the movies are kind of getting to a point where not even the fans are super thrilled by them, is yeah. this really what I want to do with my time? And I understand that. And I think that's fair to say that, but there is a condescension to some of these responses. And I don't think, I think Jody did a great job of walking the line. And obviously because Jody's a veteran, Jody's been, through all the wars, been in it for decades. I, I just, I find that to be, I just don't like people denigrating people working in this fucking business. Like people have to get, people get jobs. There's good money to it. They've got houses off of this stuff. They've got, they can feed their family, send their kids to college. Like there's work here that's being done that for some of these people, we're, we're talking, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch, Sean yeah. Mark Ruffalo, Charlize yeah. Theron. These are, these are people who have pedigree in independent film, and and have been a, a, a you know won awards and what have you. So I find it odd that she would say things like this. And I, and I really get mad when people say it about directors. To all oh, you're just in a factory. You tell me Ryan Coogler's Black Panther was a factory fucking movie. Don't be well, ridiculous. So I mean, but again, I think this is this is this is where it gets into. And this is what she said about Greta Gerwig. Now, yeah. is Greta Gerwig gonna go make a Marvel movie for Kevin Feige? Probably not. But I oh. think like. There are certain directors. Mm. Ryan Coogler is absolutely one of them. Taika Waititi is absolutely one of them. Uh, yeah. Who 
go into Marvel and make a movie and because of their pedigree and because of their take and because of their relationship behind the scenes with Kevin Feige and other people yeah, that yeah. we don't really get a lot of insight on, they get to make the movie they want to make and they really feel like they get to put their stamp on it and we as an audience feel like they got to put their stamp yeah. on it. Like you watch Black Panther and you're like, yeah, that's a Ryan Coogler movie. Yep. Um, there are other directors who have directed movies in the Marvel Universe True. who have not had that experience. Right who do not feel like they have ownership over their movie, who kind of feel like they came in and did what they could. And then Marvel said, thank you very much. We're now giving this to the visual effects house and they're <laughs> going to make the movie that we told them to make. So I think a lot of that, and as an actor, I think it's the same thing. I think when you're at a certain level of your career, you can come into the Marvel universe and you get to bring in your people and you get mm. to bring in your script person who's going to work on your lines and you get to make the character your own. Um, and then other actors come in and go, wow, I'd, I did what they told me to do. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, Sam Raimi made a Sam Raimi film in Multiverse of Madness. It wasn't what I wanted and it wasn't what you wanted, but it certainly, he got yeah. to express himself through that film. Um, so it happens. But someone like um, uh, what we saw with, uh, with the Marvels, she clearly felt like she wasn't able to express herself fully with the film and the cut that she wanted and all of this at the end. And certainly it was a lot of neck people tried to, smear her at the end as she was leaving the the film so yeah it may not be the best situation but i also think i just don't get talking down about it i get where you're at personally and that's I mean, okay speak about it but like, i mean look i think there's a lot of good things about kristen stewart yes i agree She's i don't think actor. that i don't think that anybody is going to put her uh her her um pol political correctness in the way that she expresses herself at the top of the list of attributes that she has fair point it's a fair point uh, all right, well, let's take a quick break because uh, we're at 30 minutes here. So we'll take a quick break and we'll jump into some more of your Streamlabs, Super Chats, and other topics we got going on here uh, on the Geek Buddies Live Happy Hour Edition. And we'll be right back right after this. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Oh, my. Ba you know ba ba boop, beep, bop. Don't do that. <laughs> saw the last person who made those, made those sounds. Um, all right, let's hit these Streamlabs. Oh, the Super Chats, rather, real quick. Uh, Indiana Jake says, favorite X-Men characters? Ooh, uh, okay. Ooh, God, <sighs> okay. shit. Okay. Um, Emma Frost. Okay. Emma Frost is like Jean Grey with attitude. Okay. Um, Jean Grey's got uh, I have always had a really weird kind of crush on Nightcrawler. Can't explain okay. it, but I'm going to go with it. And... Um, Hank McCoy, old school, not necessarily new school, because now Hank McCoy basically just like commits war crimes, and he's not my favorite, but I liked him a long time for a long time. And I mean, currently uh, in the comics, he's committing war crimes. Hank McCoy has gone down a bad road. Oh Hank no! McCoy, Hank McCoy needs a lot of therapy. Um, but uh, hmm. Okay, those are my favorites for now. I think that's good. For two bucks, I think that's good. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, for me, my favorite X-Men is Angel, Apocalypse Angel. That's my favorite X-Men, period. Um, Wolverine, certainly uh, my second favorite X-Men. Um, yeah, and maybe, and Rogue. I think Rogue is my third favorite X-Men, for sure. And then Storm right after that, you know. And, and then you get into Cable and Bishop, and those are the guys that I really enjoy and love. Um, no offense to Cyclops, no offense to Beast or anything like that, but those are, those are the X-Men characters that I kind of gravitate to the most, kind of the ones that outside the outside on the edges and really dealing with some traumatic stuff. I kind of like that. Uh, Francisco says, hey, Geek Buddies, you won't like my idea, but hear me out. Uh, I don't like the idea of the, MC, of the MCU pivoting away from Kang for Doctor Doom as the big bag for the multiverse saga as this is late and time. Uh, whoa, whoa, what the hell? Oh, well, we just lost Michael. Um, all right. But how about instead of introducing the MCU Doctor Doom, they could use the Fox as Doctor Doom. They can maybe bring back Toby Kebbell as Doom. Uh, I just feel like introducing the MCU Doom in the saga just don't feel right and feels rushed. Just my take. What do you guys think? Am I crazy? All right. I don't know where Michael is. I'm sure he'll come back here in just a second. So maybe I'll get a text here letting me know what's going on at some point. But yeah, that's the situation there. Uh, Kitty Pride and Wolverine. I like Kitty Pride, definitely. And uh, it's ironic that you're Rick Jones telling me you like 
Kitty Pride and Wolverine. I kind of like that as well. Um, let's see. Did you see that Finn Jones teased he might come back as Iron Fist? Ooh. I don't know if people would like that necessarily. Here, let me text Michael and see what's up. Um, you good? He probably has to reboot a system. Hopefully, uh, he'll be back here in just a second. Uh, but yeah, uh, Michael hates Rogue. Yeah, that's why he took off. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, Kitty probably. I did not see Finn Jones teasing he was going to be part of, he was going to come back. Did he? I think that would be a massively bad idea. I, I don't understand why you do that. When so many people didn't like him as Iron Fist, how did he hint at his M MCU return? Uh, an Instagram story post, Jones shared a picture of his travel bag, which features the 125th and final issue of Marvel Comics' Power Man and Iron Fist in a protective cover. It's a controversial issue ending the series with the death of Iron Fist. So if Jones is intending for this post to tease a forthcoming MCU return, it doesn't bode well for Danny Rand's future as Iron Fist. Oh, wow. Um, Jones could be, oh he also interesting enough the acclaimed children novel children's novel the never ending story which Variety reported last week would be getting a new film adaptation is also uh, in the mix here uh, for uh, Finn Jones possibly uh, so maybe he's hinting at two future projects so it seems to me if he's hinting at the death of uh, Iron Fist it's because he's going to come back to die or to hand off the mantle um, I would not be surprised if that's the decision. So, um, yeah, we could see that happening for sure. Um, I don't know what's going on with Michael. He has not texted to just update you, but hopefully he'll be back in just a second. Um, but yeah, uh, we will see. We will see what happens with that. Uh, I think that's the most you would get from Finn Jones coming back to play Iron Fist again is that he would essentially off himself and then the new Iron Fist would take over or he'd hand the mantle off to the i think they're looking at a, a female uh, asian actress to play iron fist so i wouldn't be surprised if that's what they would do there for that so um there you go i'm gonna hold off on the rest of the super chats and stream labs until mikey gets back in here oh it sounds like he's back here we go uh what oh, i miss what happened i don't know my computer i think i was running too many programs and the yeah. whole computer shut down but you guys will be to know that I used the opportunity to go refill my wine while my computer <laughs> rebooted. So I'm back. All right. First thing, um, some people asked, some people said that Finn Jones hinted at a Marvel return to play Iron Fist. He took an Instagram story and in his bag on his Instagram story was the last um, issue of Power Man and Iron Fist where Iron Fist dies in the issue. So do you think that he's essentially saying he's going to die uh, when he comes back to hand the mantle over to someone else. Does anybody besides him really care? Clearly, people commented it in the chat. So, I... Mm -hmm. Is that your fan, by the way, of your computer? It's my computer fan. Like, it overheated. Oh, like, literally, literally, it, the computer was, like, not happy with me and shut down. Yeah, it might be time to get a new one. But anyway, go ahead, yes. Whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe I'll buy a new computer tomorrow. We'll yeah. See. Keep going. Uh, now you got me stressed out about my fan. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, like, I've, we've heard that they're going to, like, relaunch Iron Fist and, like, kind of go in a yeah. whole new direction and kind of go do something more ethnically appropriate. So yes. if, for, if they're going to be making all of the Netflix series canon, it would be a nice touch to bring him in to pass the mantle. Yeah, I guess I Iron Fist is not on the high list of my Netflix shows that I'm like, oh, OK, we got it. like if they just went in a full new direction with Iron Fist and never touched the Netflix series, I'd be fine. But I can yeah. see how using him to pass the mantle to kind of just tie it all together and make it all connect would be nice. Yeah, I think that's more what we're going to see. All right. So let's go back to the super chat here that we were getting from Francisco Lopez. I don't want to leave him out on this. So did you get this part? Hey, Geek Buddies, you won't like my idea, but hear me out. I don't like the idea the MCU is pivoting away from Kang for Doctor Doom as the big bad for the multiverse saga at this late time. Uh, but how about instead of introducing the MCU Doctor Doom, they could use the Fox's Doctor Doom. They can maybe bring back Toby Kebbell as Doom. Um, and I, I just feel like introducing the MCU Doom in this saga just doesn't feel right and feels rushed. Just my take. What do you guys think? Am I crazy? Well, to be fair to everything that they've said, yeah. Uh, 
it feels like they're not going to um it feels like that's not what they're doing it doesn't seem like they're switching yeah. out like it seems like I mean, I'm just waiting for the day that they officially announced that Coleman Domingo is going to be Kang or something, but it seems like they want to stick with the <laughs> Kang thing. Yes. And they've said that Doctor Doom is not going to be the big bad in the Fantastic Four movie. Yes. So it feels like even if they're bringing Doom in, they're doing more of the slow roll with Doom. Like they're right. doing the, we're going to use Doom down the line. So in, in that way, I think they're kind of doing what you might be suggesting. I don't think they're going to bring in anybody from Fox. Right. I think they're like, those movies have seen their day and they didn't do great. So I don't think we're going to come back to that. But I do think that for all that everybody was like, okay, let's just ditch Kang and make Doom the thing and have Doom in two movies become the big bad of the Marvel Universe, it doesn't sound like that's what they're going to do anyway. Right. Yeah, I think so too. And um, Toby Kebbell is the wrong choice because that movie made no money. So why would you bring in someone who's connected to a film that made no money as Doctor Doom? And was so revered, so um, overwhelmingly destroyed. It, it wouldn't make any sense. So yeah, I don't see the logic in that. Well, before we move off, the, before we get to more X Men ninety seven, Michael, uh, we've been enjoying it. We're doing the reviews here on the channel. Hope you guys are watching. We just did our episode three review a couple of days ago. Hope you guys have watched that or listened to it on the on the podcast feed of the Geek Buddies. Um, but uh, the numbers are pretty high for this man, and uh, apparently people are going back to rewatch. The original series in record numbers as well uh but there is some controversy of course the morph stuff we knew before the show even came out but now there's some controversy around the animation style and also around gambit and his outfits of choice um are people just looking for something anything to be mad about at marvel here to be having issues with x-men 97 and particularly these two particular things. Your thoughts on the yeah. ratings and your thoughts on the issues. Well, what are the, uh, elucidate me a little bit. What are people's yeah. issues with the animation style? They're saying that it's a little too too clean and it doesn't necessarily, it's too, it's, it's too clean while trying to be evocative of the stuff from the past. And they don't necessarily feel like it's uh, what they want to see is what I would say. I mean, this is just a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> okay. Well, and the proof is in the pudding. I mean, you know, that X-Men trailer came out and the news about Morph being non-binary came out yeah. and everyone, all of the, that, all of that part of Twitter was like, go woke, go broke. Nobody wants this show. This show is going to be horrible. Why are they ruining X-Men? Why are they making X-Men woke? We all know that X-Men have never been woke. X-Men yeah. isn't about tolerance. X-Men is about people with cool powers. Get out of my face. And you're like, okay, right. you're dumb. <laughs> That's wrong. And also, X Men '97 is doing fucking great on Disney Plus. Yeah, and yeah. people are going back and watching the old X Men, so it worked. It's yeah. go woke, don't go broke. Like that's what's happening. Yeah, people were upset about Rogue because they said they made they they got rid of Rogue's butt. Well, Rogue yeah. is great. Yeah, Rogue's butt looks lovely. Now I'm I am not straight. So maybe I'm missing something and you guys can all elucidate me, but I think Rogue's butt looks just fine. And I think Rogue and Magneto and what's going on there is a fucking great Rogue story. Yeah. So that's good. I think Morph is a super cool character and it's th three episodes in and not once have they had that moment where, Ro where Morph walks in and goes, all right, guys, as the non-binary member of this team, let me tell you some things. Like Morph is just Morph. Let me school it's you. It's great. Yeah. It yeah. works really well. Um, I think he's in love with Wolverine. 100%. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then the Gambit thing, you're just like, did you guys never pay attention to Gambit before? Like, <laughs> that's who Gambit is. Like, yeah, yeah, he wore a crop top. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look here. This is what people are complaining about. This crop top here is what people are complaining about. Well, uh, I, I I don't understand this this anger people have. Gambit's always been fashion forward, man. He's always kind of done his own thing, and it's slightly androgynous at times, but still retaining his masculinity. Uh, yeah, I'm I mean, surprised. by the way, yeah. Look, maybe Gambit has hooked up with a dude in his life. I don't know. I mean, he cooks forward. a great beignet. He looks good in a crop top. Plays some good basketball. Dates a girl who he, who he can't touch. Like, I don't shoulder. know what he does in his spare time. Yeah. Um. But like, this is such a we're and, and 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 the animation style thing too. It's like, look, you're welcome to not like an animation style, but 
to go, they took the animation style from the classic 90s X-Men, yeah. which was very iconic, but also at times not great animation just because of animation oh, yeah. budgets at the time and everything else, and came up with a really cool style, spent a good amount of money on it, made yeah. it look really sharp and really good. If that's not your jam, totally fine. But like as an artistic choice, it's a very valid choice. Yeah. So I think what's happening is everybody want like they're not everybody, a certain portion of Twitter really wanted this show to come out and just like crash and burn so that they could point at it and see yeah. this is why this is why liberal Hollywood tries to make everything woke. And like X-Men 97, it's just awesome. Like yeah. it's just doing great. It most X Men fans are watching this and going, "Wow, this is really good." Like yeah. this is what Marvel should take this and go. This is how we're going to do the live action stuff. So uh, they don't really have anything to complain about. So they are really grasping at straws. Yeah, and okay. that's not to say, look, if you're listening to this right now and X Men ninety seven isn't really your thing and you're not loving it, cool. Like mm -hmm. that's totally valid. We don't all have to love the same things, but these specific things that are getting called out, yeah. it just really feels like sour grapes. Yeah, I think so too because it's such a great series and such a great way into the animated series as well. And if you've read the comics, it's a nice way to see this. Some of these stories, like we said, the Inferno storyline for episode three be a part, be in a, in a, in an animated series. So it's fun to see that element of it all. And I truly believe it's just people trying to find something to complain about because they need to make videos. They need to make money. They need to satisfy their raving, angry base uh, with something negative about Marvel because they've made so much money doing that a whole cat, a whole business off of that nonsense. So I mean, I've seen people have, get mad. I've seen people get mad about Storm's accent in the new series and right. why is she talking like a Wakandan? Like, I mean, I have really you see people yeah. on Twitter and you're like, man, you are you're you're doing your best, but there is yeah. not a lot to hate about this show. There is it is about as good as an X-Men show can be. Yeah. Well, let's stay in Marvel here, brother. The Marvel Rivals trailer. Did you get a chance to watch this trailer? What are your thoughts of on? Of course. That? Uh Please. so <laughs> I trend I tend to stay away from any video game where I'm playing with other people at the same time because I end up looking like an idiot. Um, but that being said, like I really did enjoy at the beginning playing Overwatch. Yeah. Like Overwatch was a really fun game. And so yeah, mo like when you watch Marvel Rivals the trailer, like it very much feels like that Overwatch kind of thing. Now they have come out and said, this isn't like Overwatch mainly because you can do a lot more things. Like mm -hmm. there's the team up aspect with uh, where two characters can team up and do like sort of different moves. There's right. the fact that you can destroy the environment. Like, so there's a lot of things that they're saying it's not like Overwatch, but for all intents and purposes, it's six players on this side, six players on that side. You have a goal, everybody fights and you get to be Marvel characters. Like, so in that respect, it's very, if you are a mid game player, like I am, um, it's an Overwatch type game with Marvel skin and it looks fun. I mean, yeah. you know, like there's something really fun about diving into a game and the Hulk, Loki, Scarlet Witch, Storm, yeah. Black Panther and Namor all get to go fight some people. Like that's fun. So the graphics look cool. It looks interesting. Again, as somebody who has terrible aim and tries to avoid these types of games, <laughs> much like Overwatch when it came out, I'll probably check this out. <laughs> yeah, I like the trailer. I like the dynamic nature of the trailer. And these are the kinds of games that I feel like I've aged out of. But if I was to play, if I was a little more in that age range, this game looks like oh, like a badass fun time. And you're playing these, you can win awards, you can get this extra stuff that you can buy stuff with. And so... All of that is a part of it. Plus, you get to you know see uh, some really good animation within the video game, and the designs I thought were a lot of fun. So for me, this looks like a blast. And the fact that I spent two minutes kind of showing you what the story and the look and the feel of a trailer like this or of a, a game like this, uh, they did that with the two minute trailer. I think that's a positive overall that they've got some excitement coming around this thing. And who knows if these become what motivates a live action series down the road. Yeah. You know, it could be well, a lot of fun. I also think like there's a cartooniness to the graphics that I liked. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times, yeah. like, look, like I, that one Avengers game that came out a few years ago that had Miss Marvel in it, like I oh, had yeah. just finished playing Fallen Jedi and I went over to play that game and I played it for five minutes and just like stopped. It was $60 <laughs> wasted because I, because the gameplay and the graphics, like it just felt very basic. Like it yeah. just wasn't, it wasn't it. 
And just when you look at sort of the way the graphics are done and they have this very kind of rich, almost toon shaded animated style to it, like yeah. it looks like they put some time and effort into this, which I appreciate. Like that's yeah. the type of stuff that gets me to want to play a game. Yeah, exactly. I like this. Uh, JMB says, I've been scared, uh, scarred by a 13 year old threatening to come over and have sex with my mom when I play games online. I will tell you, it is a real thing. Like Oof. you as an adult go to play those. And like, I, here's my thing. Yeah, okay. I when I'm playing a game by myself, like I just finished Spider-Man 2 recently, yeah. um, you know, the Fallen Jedi, the Jedi Order, the Fallen Jedi games, like yeah. when I'm playing by myself and I have time to sort of fail horribly and eventually figure my shit out, I'm great. Yeah. And when it comes to like hand to hand combat, using the force, web slinging, cool. When it is a shooter where I have to aim, I'm not great. And when I'm playing a game online and a bunch of 13 year olds start making fun of how bad my aim is. I have PTSD of me in middle school PE, like nobody's business. And I have to throw the controller to the side, turn the game <laughs> off and call my therapist immediately. Like it is like, nope, yeah. I can't have people telling me how bad I am at this thing. It's not good for my psyche. <laughs> CB is right. You can turn off the chat and play those games for sure. Um, or you could be like, you see, that's a way to go, Mike. I think that's a very healthy way to go. Or you could go the Kalinowski route. Uh, which uh, his uh, significant Mike other Kalinowski, Mike Kalinowski is fully Thor yes. in Avengers Endgame. When he gets onto Noob Master and says he's going to fly over there, like that's Mike Kalinowski playing <laughs> Call of Duty. I don't know if you guys ever saw, if you don't follow his, uh, his girlfriend, who's awesome, Shannon Barney, like on Instagram, she'll occasionally post stories of Michael playing at 1 a.m. in the morning, Kalinowski playing at 1 a.m. in the morning, yelling at these preteens. Uh, while he's playing Call of Duty or Modern Warfare, and it is a video you don't want to miss. Let me just tell you. So, I think that's a lot of fun. I agree. By I don't. Way, by the way, my fan, my fan stopped. Just so oh, you good, know. good. That means it's finally got a certain. Tool <laughs> my certain computer's level. back under control, everybody. <laughs> uh, I only play sports games online, and so I don't turn on the chat because people talk so much shit. So I just kind of play my game. But I have had people turn off the game multiple times when I'm beating them, which I think is. Poor form. Talk all the shit you want, but don't turn off the game. Now, Please. what if like, okay, so I don't know this, but yeah. like, can we like get like a room going where like only certain people can get in? Like, can we do like a Geek Buddies Marvel Rivals room where only people Total. that know the Geek Buddies code can come in and we can just I, have a Geek Buddies like that? I'm in for that. Yeah. Okay. As all long right. as you all don't yell at me, I'm in for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A very, a very, a very warm and welcoming online chat room playing video games. Yes, I like this idea as well uh all right one last thing before we leave the marvel universe here uh earlier this week mike we had a seven minute spider-verse short film that was dropped here from the people at uh sony and and uh the kevin love fund which is a charity there uh i did a set i did a watch along of this but they wouldn't allow me to post it on youtube but somehow um heavy spoilers got to post his reaction so maybe he had some kind of deal with them and they didn't block it so but uh, what did you think of this seven-minute video where we're essentially we're seeing uh, Miles dealing with the pressures after the first Spider-Verse movie and before the second Spider-Verse movie and eventually having a conversation with his father by the end because he is a young teenager needing some kind of advice from his dad. What did you think of this particular uh, seven-minute short film? I liked it. I didn't love it. Okay. Tell me why. I, it's beautiful. It looks great. Like they they know how to animate these movies. Like they yes, like they know sure. how to animate this. Like and it's always it's fun to see Miles. What I liked about it is that yeah. I think one of the things that's the strongest thing thematically about the Spider-Verse movies is Miles' relationship with his parents. Yes. I mean, like the first movie is very much about Miles and his dad, and the second movie Rio really steps up and like I to me yeah. all the scenes with Miles and his mom are like it, it, with with all right. the amazing action in Across the Spider-Verse, the Miles Rio scenes are some of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Okay, so agreed. making this about Miles and his dad, I really liked. But, I and I liked the setup, like he comes home from being Spider-Man, he's really stressed, dad wants to watch scary movies, Miles doesn't watch them, then he kind of has his own sort of internal scary movie happen. Yeah. But I just feel like once they got to the really scary movie part, I kind of wanted more, and I felt the resolution was kind of, um, sweet but not really impactful 
Okay. Like, like it was it was a really good short. And as someone who loves this universe, I was happy to kind of just dive into that universe and be a part of it. But it wasn't like it blew me away. And I think mm -hmm. because both Spider-Verse movies have absolutely blown me away yeah. to have a short come out and just be good. I was like, OK, it was good. But like it's almost like they're the victims of their own success. Like yeah. any Spider-Verse yeah. thing that comes out, you're like, OK, well, like fucking wow me. And this, this was just very nice. Yeah, I agree with you. I thought it was a simple story because it was clearly about, you know, a teenager, like all of us at, at our teen years, dealing with the pressures of um, expectations and uh, taking on this. Because like, yes, it's great to be flying through the air and what's up danger comes on and you've embraced becoming Spider-Man, but there's the day after and the week after and the month after where you don't understand the pressures of being Spider-Man combined with your homework load, your responsibility to your family, uh, and all of that. So um, I like that that highlighted a universal thing that a lot of teenagers go through in yeah. their lives. And the teenager not wanting to talk to their dad, their dad being a good dad, who's like, hey, if you want to talk, I'm here, blah, blah, blah. So that when he confronts himself, which is like Luke confronting himself in the tree in Empire, you because that spider is essentially him confronting himself, right. the pressures of it all, you get the symbolism, right? And so when he comes out and asks his father, for the conversation. I thought it was a very sweet moment. But Michael, I think you hit the criticism correctly right on the head. We didn't spend enough time in the drama pressure world where he is fighting the spider and swinging around and finding a way to defeat it. He would still have wanted to talk to his father, but having him defeated, I think, would have been an interesting thing to see. That being said, I think the message was we all get overwhelmed. We all have tough yeah. moments. Talk to the people who can help you they will guide you through these tough moments. Trust me. And I you. think that was lovely. And, I, and like, that's the thing is I don't think there's nothing about this. Tr there's nothing about this short that I'm like, well, that really failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it was a very nice short. I just mm -hmm. feel like it wasn't like a spectacular short. So, oh, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> On a scale of spectacular to amazing to... <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, it was really, really nice, but, yeah. uh, I was, when I woke up and got excited, I was like, oh, that new Spider-Verse short came out. I watched it. And I'm like, okay, that was fine. Yeah. Also in the chat, I just want to yeah. be really clear. Yeah. Uh, Beyonce did not butcher Jolene. Beyonce's cover of Jolene is amazing. That album fucks. It's awesome. So just so we're clear on the chat, I'm going to have to disagree. Beyonce's cover of Jolene is amazing. I'm going to have to disagree with you. I did not. What? The cover. You ruined the whole meaning of the song. No, is, she's ruined. coming for Jolene. She's coming yeah. for her. Yeah, that's what I'm Jolene, saying. You changed Jolene's the days are numbered. Jolene with the good hair. Uh, Jolene, but yeah. <laughs> Jolene, don't you fuck it. Jolene, we're not being nice anymore. We were nice years ago. We're done. Get the fuck out. That's what she said. You don't want this smoke is what she said. But look, I, I, I understand why you'd want to do this in 2024, make it more of an empowering song. But it is okay to have songs where women are actually intimidated by other women trying to steal their men because that does happen. Hello, Brittany Snow. That does happen in situations in, in, the, in, our, in our pop culture world. So I thought changing the meaning, I just didn't like it. Although I thought the lyrics worked for her version of it. I just didn't like it. It felt bad. And Listen. I know Dolly's fine with it, but I, I just well, didn't. Well, Dolly, Dolly, yeah. First of all, Dolly's fine with it. So everybody can just. I know. Everybody Dolly's can chill because the Dolly's but, okay with it. Yeah. But also, here's what I'll say. I, I, I hear this on Geek Buddies. Let's break down hey. Cowboy Carter. Um, <laughs> but I will say that, like, I mean, I get it. But, like, we've seen, there's been some amazing covers of Jolene. There's yeah, been some amazing EDM remixes of Jolene. Like, Jolene's one of my favorite songs. Yeah. But having a new take on it, like, we already have the version that's like, I'm intimidated. Please don't take my man. Right. So having the other side of it that's like, bitch, back the fuck off. Like, yeah. it was nice to have that as a counterpoint. And it feels right for this album. <laughs> Anyways, everybody go listen to Cowboy Carter because it's great. Yeah. I did like the first one she released. I like that. Texas uh, Hold'em? Yeah, Texas Hold'em was good. So I like that. So, uh, But I'm looking forward to listening to the rest of the songs. Yaya's yeah, yeah. my favorite song, everybody. Yaya yeah, yeah on yeah, Cowboy yeah. Carter is okay. the best song on that album. I like that idea. All right, let's take a quick break because we're at the 30-minute mark again, and we'll come back and answer some more of your Streamlabs Super Chats and get into some trailers as well uh, and talk a little Bad Batch as well right after this. Jolene, 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 Jolene. I'm begging you now, please don't take my man. You gotta sing it with her vibrato, right? 
Jolie, Jolie, Jolie. That's how Beyonce does it. All right. Anyway, uh, let's get into let's get into some of these trailers, man. We had a Bad Boys Four trailer that dropped to Michael. We had Unfrosted, which is a comedic take on the birth of the of the Pop Tart, which uh, is still out there, and the Costco sells them by the bulk. In case anyone's wondering. So what were your thoughts on these? I thought these were the two biggest trailers this week. What are your thoughts yeah. on uh, these two trailers? Uh, what'd you feel about them? Well, first I'll say, I always think of you when I watch a Bad Boys trailer. Yeah! <laughs> John and I in college, both very much. I will go on a limb. Now, I love Armageddon for mm -hmm. all its cheesiness. I love it. I but I, I, I think there is an argument to be made that the first Bad Boys movie is still Michael Bay's best movie. You could absolutely make that I, argument. I think you could make a case that the first Bad Boys movie is Michael Bay's best movie. And I love the first Bad Boys movie. Mm -hmm. And in college, when John and I first became friends, there was a lot of discussion yeah. about how he was Martin Lawrence and I was Will Smith in the Bad Boys movie. To the point where we actually were like talking about how we should write a script that was basically bad boys, except the Will Smith character was a gay cop. Like we yes. had a whole thing going on. So anytime I see a bad boys trailer come along, um, I think of John. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's one of the, like, do we need another bad boys movie? No. But when you watch the two of them together. I know. Like it just. It just sort of is like, it's one of those franchises that like either you're in or you're out. I mean, like, and this is how I feel about the Fast and the Furious franchise in the other way. Like there are people, John is one of them and a lot of you are, where like, you know the Fast and the Furious movies are stupid at this point, oh, but you're in, you're in. So like a movie comes out, you're like, I'm gonna go. To me, the Bad Boys movies, as silly as they are, it's a little bit like that. Like Martin Lawrence and Will Smith work really well together. Their dynamic is a lot of fun. So like, Martin Lawrence going into the convenience store and buying oh. the buying the stuff and then Will Smith coming in and getting mad at him and the guy being like, I'm trying to rob you here. And they're like, excuse us, we're having a conversation. Like, I it's I don't know if the movie's gonna be good, but I'm like, okay. It's kind of how I feel about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you get just to see that? What'd you think of that? Oh, yeah. Look, that movie's <laughs> not good, but I loved it. Yeah. Like, like we got out of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire yeah. and I'm like, I can go down the list of reasons why this movie is a mess from a story standpoint. Like stuff yeah. just didn't even make sense. Yeah. But I came out and I was happy. Like it just, and I think that's the thing is like, look, I, and, and like we could do it. Like if we ever wanted to, like we could do a Ghostbusters Frozen Empire spoiler review. Oh yeah. And I can go through all the reasons that that story is a disaster, mm -hmm. but also I enjoyed it. And I think that's okay sometimes. And Bad Boys is like that to me. I don't think Bad Boys is high cinema, but I'm excited. Unfrosted, on the other hand, was a trailer that I was completely uninterested in watching. Yeah, did I. Um, and A, a banger cast, like from top to bottom. Yeah, man. I mean, when you I got Hugh Grant, who? yeah, when you've got Hugh Grant dressed up in a Tony the Tiger costume, you've got something going on. Um, but it looks really weird and funny and heightened. Like, it's it's written by Jerry, right? Like Jerry yeah. Seinfeld wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it very much feels like it has a written by Jerry Seinfeld kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Um, and that was one where I only watched the trailer because John was like, hey, we should talk about it on Geek Buddies on Friday. And I was like, yeah, okay. And then I watched it and I was like, oh, this this is kind of crazy. So I'm into it. He he just correction, he directed it, he didn't write it. Right. Okay. Uh, which I think is, you know, fantastic. Uh, he is listed in the writing credits, but there's three other writers in it. So I'm sure Jerry threw in his jokes where he wanted to in his jokes. That being said, this is a who's who of comedy. Like you've got yeah. Melissa McCarthy, as you say, Hugh Grant, Rachel Harris is in this, Dan Levy is in this, Thomas Lennon, Amy Schumer, Max Greenfield, Bill Burr, who's playing a great Jack Kennedy, by the way, Fred Armisen, of course, Seinfeld, who narrates it, Cedric Yarborough from Reno 911, James Marsden, Ronnie Chang, Jack McGrath, Jim Gaffigan, Bobby Moynihan. The list is endless. In it's insane. Of, yeah. When you have three dudes, when you have three dudes walking around and snap, crackle, pop, like. <laughs> I lost my shit when I saw that. And, you know, it's like the <laughs> comedically <laughs> dramatic, the comedically dramatic retelling <laughs> of the origin of the Pop-Tart yes. is a wild concept, but it's interesting. Like, that's something I haven't seen before. 
I agree. I agree. And, I, and who was playing the Quaker, the Quaker Oats guy? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, I totally expected to hate this. And I couldn't believe that I came out of this trailer going, I want to fucking see this movie. This looks like a lot of fun. Um, and with Bad Boys 4, I did a trailer reaction to it. But all I can say is this. I mean, the first, the third one, the same director is coming back to do this one. That made 420 something million dollars worldwide just as we were going into the into COVID. So yeah. the fact that it was able to make that much money shows you there's still an appeal here. And I think the script works well in the third one for the for understanding the chemistry of Will and Martin. And I think this one will do well. Um, but I do want to I do see this as a bit of a litmus test on where Will is in people's minds. Like, are people still obsessed with the slap and they won't go see the movie? Or will this kind of overcome all of that and make its money? I I'll be curious to see. You know what I'm saying? Here's the thing. Yeah. I yes. I'm th well. It's I, I'm trying to think how I feel about this. Like Will okay. Smith getting up and slapping Chris Rock That's is fair. dumb. Yes, is fair. dumb. Yes, agree. Like it's just stupid. Like yeah. it was a dumb thing to do. Agree. And it was a dumb thing to do in the most public forum possible. <sighs> yeah. Um. So yeah, like bad behavior, like stupid, but they're both grown adults. Yes. They've both had conversations. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why we all need to harp on it forever. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of, and, and, and maybe I'm wrong and if people feel differently, like I actually would welcome this in the chat, welcome this in the comments, but, but I just kind of feel like it, there's certain things where there's certain people that do things like, look, if Mel Gibson went away and never came back, I'd be perfectly happy. He, okay. because, because it, it will, with Mel Gibson, a, the things that he said are pretty fucking horrible and vile, yeah. but B he said them multiple times. Right. Right. It wasn't one. Like it's been, it's yeah, repeated yeah. behavior. Like you sort of reach a point where you're like, Okay, this is clearly how you feel. <laughs> and I don't think that's changing. And then when you get into like, you know, the Harvey yeah. Weinstein, like anything that's like sexual assault, you were a predator, great. You mean great, like get out of here. Not great, great. Yes, 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 great, like. I don't want anybody clipping we're done that. With, like, yes, very clear. Like it's a bad, bad soundbite, bad Geek Buddy soundbite. Great as in, yes, absolutely, we're done with you. Absolutely, you don't get to come back in. But, you know, you yeah. you were in a, by all uh, conversations that have happened, a interesting marriage. Sure, sure, sure. And you probably have a lot of feelings about it. And Chris Rock said something and you got heated and you did yeah. a very stupid thing. But, like, are we going to really, like, hold that over you forever? I don't know. Yeah. It feels, it, it, feels, it feels like a lot. It feels like a lot to hold on to. Yeah, I was saying that because some people were commenting about that in my trailer reaction. I'm like, guys, I mean, he spent decades entertaining us, like, with music, with movies, TV shows. Like, one slap chain. He didn't murder Chris Rock. He didn't kill Chris Rock's family. He slapped a man in a, in a confused moment of chivalry. Um, and allowed his anger to get the best of him. I'm sure he was super nervous whether he was going to actually win that Best Actor award. What he had kind of worked his entire life to get since um, uh, Six Degrees of Separation, he finally had a bit, and I, I think he just short circuited. Yeah. It happens. People make. By the way, movies. all you people in the chat saying you're going to do a clip show of all of my quotes taken out of concept, <laughs> context. Don't, don't Please you don't. dare! Don't you do it? Exactly. So, I mean, you know, he makes he made a mistake, but he apologized for it multiple times. He, you know, Chris Rock had his say in his stand up special. Um, uh, Jada had her say on on tape on the Red Talk or whatever it was. And then did that biography. Jada, Jada has said her J J Jada has had her piece and then some. Exactly. So we all need to move on and let it go, because at this point, if you're still holding on to it, I think it's something personal. And I think for some people, it is racism. I won't deny that. But I think for other people, it's something personal, well, and I don't know what it is. But here's the thing, and like this is not uh, this doesn't apply to any of you in yeah. the chat currently, or anybody listening to this because it's not our job. But like, there's a different look. If you personally don't like Will Smith, and you're like, I think that was stupid. I don't ever want to watch a Will Smith movie again. Don't watch a Will Smith movie. That's true, right? What it really, yeah. what it really applies to is yeah. the business, the industry. Like there yeah. are people that like do something and then they don't get work, and all your, like Jonathan Majors, that's happening mm. right now, and. 
you know, like he, the, the, there was a bunch of movies that Jonathan Majors was going to be in. And yeah. then the verdict came in and Jonathan Majors is not in those movies anymore. So with Will Smith, the slap happened, the Oscars happened. And then there was a bunch of movies that Will Smith was executive producing or attached to be in. Yeah, yeah. And those went away really quickly. Went away. Yep. And, and for that moment, cool. I get it. But, you know, a year later, like it's it, John has said this multiple times. It's like, you know, Mel Gibson is in the Continental. So, yeah. you know, if Mel Gibson can make it into the Continental, then I think Will Smith can be in Bad Boys 4. If you're still cheering for Charlie Sheen, but you have an issue with Will Smith, I got I'm going to need you to explain that to me real deeply. I, you know, it's, it's a different situation. Um, all right. So let's see what else. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's hit some of these Streamlabs Super Chat. Then we'll talk about Bad Batch as well uh let's see some more of these comments from you all which we totally thank you very much for and appreciate uh cowboys fan 92 says let's freaking go oh my god as we have all said this follow-up to x-men the animated series in the form of x-men 97 has blown me away as a 90s kid also where would you say i should start when it comes to tox men comics i don't know what tox men comics is. when it comes to x-men comics oh, John. oh sorry about that uh, to x-men comics <laughs> <laughs> he just reads what's how's, on the prompter, folks. How's that? How's that whiskey going? <laughs> how's that Knob Creek, buddy? Um, San Diego, man. Oh, I yeah, can't yeah. tell you where to start in X Men comics oh. because it's a fucking mess. I, I, right. I think that um, if you wanted to do the most recent run, um, starting with like the powers of X comic into the Krakoa era, which is about to end is a nice place to sort of jump on and go, okay, that's this era. That being said, there's going to be a bunch of characters that pop up that start talking about their past relationships, and you're going to be like, I don't know what's going on. Um, and then this summer, as the Krakoa era is ending, the new era of X-Men is going to kick off, which probably sounds like a good time to jump on. But, yeah. you know, with X-Men, it's kind of like jumping on to a soap opera. Like, mm -hmm. you have to jump on at any point that you jump on to and just start reading yeah. And know that for the first four to five months that you're reading the comic, you're not going to know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. When John and I were in London together, uh, my junior year of college, we were a block. Our, our our study center that we lived in was a block away from the Forbidden Comics well, yeah. uh, comic book store. Right. And I hadn't been reading comics for a couple of years. And I started buying X-Men comics. And I just didn't. I just started buying them in the middle of wherever they were. And I didn't know what the fuck was going on. And I just started at that point, And then I just kept going for years. So you just sort of jump on wherever you jump on and then just keep going. Yeah, I agree with Michael. Like I, I would say go back. If you want to go back, start with the Jim Lee run or start with the Chris, Claire, Chris Claremont run. Those are great runs that you can jump in. And yes, you'll still have to do catch up, but you'll enjoy those runs very much so. But like Michael said, the most current run, I think a lot of people are talking very positively about so if you were to jump in with something a little more recent you could do that because some of those references that you see in the claremont or the jim lee are going to be a little bit dated some of those references because they were topical at the time so you, you can make your choice there in, in that way and uh michael's right i mean x-men it, it's like he's michael's getting into doctor who now it's just like that you got to jump in wherever you jump oh, in yeah. doctor who, and then figure out how to get all the other information going backwards when you can yeah yeah Absolutely. Doctor Who, I, I jumped in and I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's <laughs> happening right now, but I like it. <laughs> Exterminate. All right, JB says, coming in late, watching from the beginning at one and a half times speed. Thank you. If you're going to be in Japan, Michael, I'll be your personal guide in Tokyo. Hello. Also, technical, technically, Tokyo DL is actually in Chiba. Pref. Oh, yeah, know. that's true. Okay. It's not technically in Tokyo. It's outside. Uh, okay. yeah, hit me up. I'm down. I need a tour guide. Show there me some go. cool stuff. There you go. Uh, Brandon says, uh, would you want to see upgrade? Would you want to see an upgrade in Holland's suit to help portray an older Spider-Man? Maybe a suit that is more padded or even some type of armor, not Iron Man armor, LOL. I mean, honestly, I kind of like the opposite idea. Okay. Like what I liked about the end of No Way Home is that he no longer had the Tony Stark suit. He no That's longer true. had all the stuff. Like he sewed his own suit. He had yeah. to make a Spider-Man suit. So I think a Spider-Man that sort of has a suit that is designed along the lines of what his Tony Stark suit was looking like, yeah, but yeah. is just a suit. He's got no armor. He's got no upgrades. He's got no Stark tech. He's just doing what he can do. Like, yeah. I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe of Spider-Man going in the reverse order that Spider-Man in the comics went in is kind of interesting. Right, right. I agree. I, I think I agree with everything Michael said. I, I like that idea as well. Uh, Carlton Rudder says, evening from the UK. What's up, Carlton? 
Couldn't let a live show go without me posting a super chat. Mike, you are as witty as you are wonderful. John, you're the awesome. Oh, thank you, brother. I mean, I'll take witty and wonderful over awesome, but yeah, thank you. That's fine. I don't need much. <laughs> Francisco says, do you guys believe the MCU will get X-Men fully right? Good question. What I mean is a lot of times the MCU touches, but don't really dive too deep on political racism, LGBTQ, civil rights, immigration, and others, and that the big main core, and that's at the main core of the X-Men. What do you think? Yeah, Mike. It's a, that's actually a really good question. Yeah. Like, well, and, it, and like, we'll split it into two things. Like, do I think that the MCU is going to get the X-Men right? I think they're going to get it more right than Fox did on the whole. 100%. Like, Fox had, like, X-Men 2, when it came out, was the greatest superhero movie ever made. X-Men 2 now is a little dated. A little dated. Uh, I, I love X-Men First Class. I think X-Men Days of Future Past is really, really great. Um, but on the whole, like, X-Men's been really hit or miss with Fox. Yeah. I think that the MCU knows how important the mutants are to them. And even if they're sort of fumbling their way to Secret Wars right now, I think they have a pretty strong plan for what they're going to do with X-Men. And I think they'll get it more right than wrong. Now, do I think they're going to fully dive into the political racism, LGBTQ, civil rights, immigration. I think they'll touch on it in the best they can. I don't think they'll do it to the degree that some people would want them to do it. I think they'll do it as if the paintbrush is one of those ma one of those um, brooms from the janitor in Abbott Elementary. One of these big, they'll do a big paintbrush they will not get into specifics. And some of it will be kind of coded and maybe shielded a little bit. But yes, they they have to address this stuff as it pops up in certain situations because it is such an important part of the X-Men. But I don't think, as we've seen from, from uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier and other shows, they don't like to dive too deep in these topics. They like to address them, but they don't necessarily like too deep. And it's too deep. So I don't anticipate that with the X-Men. And to be fair... The Vox X-Men series didn't dive too deep into that stuff either. You had the illusions of certain things, but I don't think it dove too deep into it itself. So Yeah. Um, Brandon, because it's different comic versus theatrical. It's two different things. Brandon says, why do you think Fox's X-Men never got Gambit into the main films? I mean, they had him in with that Wolverine movie, and it was bad. <laughs> it was, it was bad. Time. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, you know, Gambit's one of those characters that, like, he's so uh, broad. Yeah. Like, he works in animation, but the whole, like, hey, shit, mon ami, I'm making some beignets. <laughs> I'm French in New Orleans. Like, it's so sort of silly and over the top <laughs> that, like, trying to adapt that in live action, you get kind of what you got in the Wolverine movie. I think, like, you have to, you got to pull Gambit back a little bit. Yeah. yeah. For live action. That's why I never bought that Channing Tatum was going to do it. I thought that was the worst idea ever. Uh, I never thought he'd be an effective gambit. Um, Gigi Chiney says, uh, hi, long time watcher here. Hey, thank you, Gigi. Please, I'd like to know if you have watched the animated series Iwaju, which is on Disney+. Plus. If so, what did you think? I'm curious about Michael's thoughts because of his background in animation. Thanks. So I was really excited when they announced Iwaju. Yeah. And then the trailer came out and it came out. And I do, I am meaning to watch it, but... The animation didn't grab me right off the bat, okay. but I love that it is set in sort of a techno-futuristic Africa. Mm -hmm. So I do need to watch it. So I will tell you what I think. Uh, maybe maybe I'll download it for the plane trip to Japan. Yeah. But I haven't watched it yet. Have yeah, you watched it? And what do you think of it? I watched the first episode. Uh, I liked the concept of where they're going. I've got to swing back and watch the rest of them. Um. And I thought it was kind of bold, to be honest with you. And I think that's where Disney is really taking chances is with animation. Like you can see them taking chances of some of these projects that have come out. And I like that. And I enjoy that about Disney. Like, you know, because they know that if you come into animation, you, there's a different approach. And there's not as many people coming to animation as there is theatrical. So they can take some chances. And I think Iwaju took a lot of nice chances in that first episode. So uh, unfortunately, there's so much other... Stuff that's going on right now, I haven't been able to swing back to it, but I will eventually swing back to it and watch it. And I do like the animation style, and I like the voiceover work. Uh, and it doesn't, it, yes, it, it is a kid's thing, but it, it doesn't always feel that way, which I think is a nice way to keep me involved in it and interested in it. As well. All right, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check it out. 
Uh, Connor Dorian says, what do you think about the Fantastic Four movie taking place in another universe? Mike, is is that, that confirmed? It's not confirmed. He's just asking if that's maybe a possibility if that's what's going to happen. I think that's the only way it makes sense. If mm -hmm. it's if it's actually set in the 1960s, I mean, there's no version of the MCU where the Fantastic Four exists in the 1960s and we've just never heard about it until that yeah. point. Like, right. like if they tried to come out and be like, oh yeah, that happened in the 60s. We've just never mentioned it till now. <laughs> that would be dumb. So uh, if they are actually in the 1960s, I like it taking place in a different universe. Mm -hmm. Also, Reed Richards is one of those characters that I completely buy him jumping into a, a different universe at any point. Yes. Like if yes. Reed Richards is in the 1960s and we watch an entire period piece in the 1960s in a different universe and the solution at the end is for Reed Richards to rip apart the multiverse and jump through and he ends up in the MCU, I'm more than okay with that. I like that idea too, and then I think that makes the most sense because, like you said, they they would have to have been around throughout all of this stuff, and how come they never chimed in or participated or got involved? So you'd have to ask questions of that. So putting them in another universe and then bringing them in makes the most sense. But I don't know, man. That multiverse stuff is really falling apart and stumbling around. So I don't know if I trust them to get it right, but I hope that they do because I love the I acting mean, involved in this, man. I think that. Doctor Strange expect? and the Multi I think Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness really flubbed the multiverse. Yes, 100%. I think Loki deals with the multiverse pretty well. Yes. Yes, the season 2 does for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that a character like Reed Richards mm -hmm. even in another universe figuring out the multiverse and explaining the multiverse to us. Yeah. And then jumping into another universe like could actually like clean up a lot of their multiverse issues. <laughs> oh yeah. That's an interesting point. Okay. I could see that for sure. Uh, all right. Let me take this one. Oh, uh, thank you to uh, Tanya Tyler for the super sticker. Very kind of you, Tanya. Um, and uh, Michael, we got two more stream labs and then we'll take a quick break and jump into some okay. more stuff here. Sean Vernon says, hello, my friends. What's up, Sean? Good to see you. Says it's been a while since I've heard anything about Disney's live action gargoyles project. Do you think it's dead? And could the success of X Men '97 possibly bring an animated Gargoyles to Disney Plus? Well, Michael, you are good friends with Greg Weisman. I certainly know Greg Weisman in interview a number of times, and I know he loves that Gargoyles project very, very much. So, what are your thoughts? Do you have any knowledge on this? What can you say? I have no knowledge on it. Okay. Um, I know that at last I heard uh, any Gargoyles projects. I don't know that Greg was a part of, um, but even though I think he should be. Of um, but I do think it's interesting. I think that the success of X-Men 97 mm -hmm. might, maybe that's the thing they need. Like, I, I think the issue that I've had is that most of the rumors surrounding a Gargoyles project tend to be a Disney Plus live action series. And I think we right. talked about this a while ago that yep. I don't know how you do a Disney Plus series with it, even though the Disney Plus budgets can be significant. Yeah. I don't know that how you do a Gargoyles live action series with a bunch of live action Gargoyles uh, running around and make it not look silly. And I think that the success of X-Men X 97 is absolute proof that fans from that era of animation yeah. will watch an animated series yeah. that picks up where they left off and gives them the adult show that they thought they were watching back then. So, yeah, I mean, I think the X-Men 97 of it all might, maybe that's the thing that we need. Like, because what I would love, I mean, as a fan, what I would love, and as a animation writer, a project that I would love to work on mm. would be a updated gargoyles animated series that is allowed to be as adult as x-men 97 is like mm -hmm. i think that yeah. it would be just fantastic to be able to continue that world with those characters uh it would just be awesome so yeah. you know i i'm a i'm a big proponent of wanting to see more gargoyles in the universe and i know that greg weissman is working on the gargoyles comic book which is out right now um nice. which is a continuation of the gargoyles animated series and I would love to see that brought to Disney Plus. And yeah, maybe, you know, I think there's a lot. I was actually having a meeting this morning where I talked to somebody about this, that, mm. you know, between X-Men 97 and Invincible and Has Been Hotel and Vox Machina and um, Delicious in Dungeon. And 
I mean, the, the arcane. There has been huge success in the past few years. Blue Eye Samurai. Uh, my, my, my adventures with Superman, uh, Blue Eye Samurai. Like, there have been some pretty significant hits that are adult targeted, animated, sci fi, fantasy, superhero. Like, that's becoming a bigger and bigger market. And so if we saw that become something where Disney Plus and Amazon and HBO Max started spending more money on those kind of things, like I think that would be great for us as fans and it would be great for me as a writer. So I love that. <laughs> yeah, I don't disagree with you and I hope to see it uh, coming down the road. And look, Young Justice was brought back after the yeah. fans clamored for it. Um, I think Static Shock is still on its way back and we've seen X-Men 97. So. Hopefully that'll happen for gargoyles at some point. Cause I know a lot of people love gargoyles. Oh my God. Um, all right. Doug developer says, hi guys caught late night with the devil last night. And wow. David Das Malchin was absolutely fantastic at it. So happy to see him in a leading role after having so many smaller parts. Who would you like to see lead a film for the first time that has not led a film before? Oh, interesting. Ooh. Who would I like to see lead a film who has not led a film before? Damn, that is a good question. Is that your fan or a plane? That's a plane. Calm down. My computer <laughs> is fine. Um, I'd like to see my computer lead a film. <laughs> who would I? I'm trying to think of someone who, like, I've just seen recently in something um, that I've been really impressed by. Have you been watching Shogun or no? Yeah. Okay. Do you think? Any Cosmo Jarvis, Anna Sawai, do you think either of those two deserve to lead a film yet? Just yet? Maybe. I mean, okay. look, Shogun impresses the hell out of me from top to bottom. So yeah, really, anybody attached to Shogun on any level, I'm happy to see go do other things. Like, like I think the entire cast is fantastic. I think the show is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think... Um, most of the cast of Abbott Elementary is popping into my mind for oh, reasons that I yeah. don't know, but like I'm just, I, I just think everyone on that show is so fantastic. And L. Uh, sure. right? Yeah. What about Paul Dano? You know, just having do having done the Riddler, I don't think he's led uh, anything. That's like he's been the lead. I'm trying to think of the type of movie that Paul Dano would lead. I like the I like the Catherine Hahn suggestion. Well, I mean, she's about to lead. I mean, right? we're going to see her at the end well, of this year leading her own show. So we will see that. Right, right, right. Interesting. All right. All right. Well, we, I would have said, well, I guess, never mind. He's already leading stuff because we have Monkey Man coming out very soon. I would. Have, I know he's in Slumdog and all that, but Dave Patel's an adult. I, I, he's done Lion, and then he did this. Uh, he's doing this Monkey Man thing, so I'm glad to see him doing that. Uh, at least as David Tennant. David Tennant for sure. I mean, I guess, I mean, Doctor Who, he did lead. I mean, he was yeah. Doctor Who, but yeah. I do, but I mean, like David Tennant doing more work is a hundred percent. He was also Uncle Scrooge in DuckTales, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to see him do more. Yeah. Uh, I like this suggestion here from Ryan Clem Barnes. Billy Magnuson should lead the Booster Gold series. By the way, that's great casting for yeah, Booster Gold. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Because having just seen the Roadhouse uh, film where he was completely wasted in that movie, uh, Magnuson deserves better, and I would love to see him lead a Booster Gold series. I, as I said, it's, if it's not Ryan Gosling, who I think is the perfect choice for it, Billy Magnuson is a nice choice for it, for sure. Um, all right, Rupert Grint is interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, but he's led some stuff, just smaller stuff. Um, Stan, oh, this, this is the last one. Stan Hemphill says, I thought I was done with the multiverse, but then I thought of Michael B. Jordan's alternate universe, Black Panther in live action. I may need that. You guys are great. Keep up the great work. Any plans to take questions during Jedi Way? Yes, at some point we will have another live Jedi Way show stand down the road for sure. We've just been getting our feet wet with Kevin joining the show. But at some point down the road, we will have ourselves a nice love, a live uh, Jedi Way. Maybe have some drinks while we're doing that. But, but yeah. if you got any Star Wars questions today, bring them on. Yeah, you can send them in for sure. Um, what do you think of this? Uh, Michael, verse, uh, Michael B. Jordan's multi alternate universe in Black Panther, do we need that? What do you think? In live action? What do you think? No. Are we saying that like bringing Michael B. Jordan in as a black as the Black Panther from another yeah, universe? Like what if and shit or whatever. Yeah. Listen, more Michael B. Jordan is never a bad idea. Um yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm not done with the multiverse, but that's just because I'm a comic book guy who oh 
is used to the multiverse and has seen it used in DC and Marvel and everything yeah. to great. I mean, and by the way, comics have done the bad version too. I mean, you can use the multiverse to sort of do some really stupid storyline, and yeah. then you can use the multiverse to do something like the original Spider Verse storyline, which led to the Spider Verse movies oh. that we have. So, you know, X Men X Men uses multiverse every other day. Yeah. Like, there's <laughs> different realities and time travel and weird shit. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, if there was ever a reason to go like, this would be great to bring this in. We want to do this. Like, this will be a great story. Like, the multiverse is just a good tool. Um, I do think that maybe Marvel overestimated how they were handling the multiverse and has kind of like, you know, flubbed it a bit. So we'll see if they can sort of right that ship. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I agree with that. Uh, Elise thinks the Michael verse would work. Uh, I mean, I'm listen, saying. the more Michaels, the better. Can I, am I right? Am I right? Really, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> One is plenty. Let me just say that. One. <laughs> um, all right, let's take a quick break. And on the other side, we'll talk Bad Batch and answer any final Streamlabs or Super Chat questions you guys have uh, for us and uh, run through a quick um, Roka's Roundup of stuff as well right after this. Nothing really. The X Men song can't do the X Men song or nothing. Ba na 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 ba na 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 na. Actually, should have done like. Yeah. I I can't do Bad Batch. That's Shannon's thing. I could do Star Ooh. Wars, but no, no, no. Don't do Bad Batch. I'm I'm gonna just put some more ice in my drink here. Uh, uh, ice in my drinks. That's my new rap song. Ice in my drinks. All right. Um. But okay. Let's do Bad Batch. Uh, let's talk right. about it, brother. Um. Episode nine dropped this past week the and harbinger the harbinger and finally asajj ventress is upon us and mike i thought it was going to be like her showing up at the end or a small scene this was asajj ventress heavy man talk about leaning into it uh and this is going to be a spoiler review guys so if you haven't seen it maybe you can turn it down for a few minutes because we're, we're not going to talk about more than five ten minutes about the about the show um were you surprised by this did you like the way they used her did you like the omega and the clones working around it and the overall message at the end and did they 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 said the word they said the m word so we got that far what do you thought what were your thoughts on the tip we did get the m word we did get it explained we did have a saj ventress sort of run omega through some basic jedi training and i liked it i look I, I, it's the same thing I said the other week when we had that episode where they were with Rex and the clones and you and Shannon really liked it. And then oh, yeah. you guys kind of talked about how then Rex gave this really big speech at the end and it was really great. And I was like, sure, but that's Rex. Right. Fair point. Fair and point. I kind of feel like this, like I really enjoyed this episode, Yeah. but I enjoyed this episode because Asajj Ventress was in it. Yeah, true. hundred percent. And I do think that Bad Batch still sort of does suffer at times from this like, the Bad Batch are kind of, at times, the least interesting, and I like them all fine, but they're kind of the least interesting characters. Like, they all were kind of there, and Asajj Venture showed up, and Omega was like, I want to see if I have midi-chlorians, and she was like, all right, I'll test you. And the Bad Batch kind of just, like, clutched their pearls to the side, and were like, we don't know if you're good or bad. Well, they did and have they the were... fight. What? They did have the fight. They had the fight, and it was fine. Asajj Ventress was going to smoke them if she wanted to. Um, so I really liked seeing Asajj Ventress, but I kind of was left going, wow, really rather follow her at the end of this episode and see what she's going. <laughs> like, like, I, like I, I, she's kind of more interesting. Like, And I do think it's because they just sort of, and they did the same thing in this episode. Like, they have Asajj Ventress show up. She explains what midichlorians are. She tells them that this is why the Empire is probably after Omega. She runs Omega through the training. She says Omega is does not have a high enough M counter, isn't force sensitive. And then uh, Hunter's like, you're lying. Yeah. And she's like, maybe I am, but she really wants to stay with you. And I'm like, cool. But like they they, they just keep doing this thing where they, they just they own every episode of Bad Batch wants to move the story forward this much. Yeah, just this much. Yeah, just yeah. as much. Ending the episode with Asajj Ventress going, yeah, you are force sensitive. Yeah. And you can either come train with me or you can stay with your uh, your buddies here. And Omega decides to stay with the buddies. And then Hunter's like, maybe this is the wrong thing. Maybe she should go. And oh my gosh, now it's really complicated. That's interesting now, conflict. Yeah. Now that's an interest. Now, now there's conflict. And so yeah. they kind of do this mm. thing where every episode of The Bad Batch is like, okay, we'll just move it forward this much. And then the next episode, we're going to move it forward this much. Like you could have had an episode where they found out about M Count. Yeah. At the same time that Fennec Shan showed up, 
heard them talking about M count, contacted Asajj Ventress. Asajj Ventress shows up, goes, she's force sensitive. What are you gonna do now? And we could have like really moved things forward. And I just think the Bad Batch, Bad Batch, I love the characters. The animation is flawless. I love when they bring in legacy characters that I'm a really big fan of. Yeah. But I just, every time I leave Bad Batch, you know, like we talked about X-Men 97 this week. Yeah, yeah. X-Men 97, you found out that Jean Grey was a clone. Yep. She became the Goblin Queen. She tortured everybody in the X-Mansion. Yeah. She stole Nathan Summers, took Nathan Summers to Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister put Nathan Summers in a vat of some shit. Yeah. Madeline Pryor fought everybody. Jean Grey fought Madeline Pryor. Madeline Pryor turned around, said to Scott Summers, let's go save our baby, yeah. saved the baby. And then they said, this baby has a techno virus. And Bishop took the baby into the future in 30 minutes. That would have been a season and a half of Bad Batch. <laughs> and they still had the Madeline Jean goodbye. I'm going to go find yeah. myself. You but that, so like, that's like, like I, I, I get, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of shows where I have to agree with you. Man. You move at warp speed and like yeah. X-Men 97 in three episodes has done more yeah. than Bad Batch would do in a season. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that like, and I like it, like everything that Bad, Bad, Bad Batch does is fine, right. but it's like, oh, we need to find, we, oh, look, Omega has this data pad from Mount Tantus. So let's set, spend an entire episode going somewhere to unlock the data pad. And then at the end of the episode, we unlock the data pad. Yeah. So then in the next episode, we take what we learned in the data pad and we go on a whole adventure to go, okay, well now, then let's spend a whole episode with Fennec Shand. Yeah. And you know, so it's like, they just keep doing it. It's like they move at this pace that I don't love. Yeah, ever since they've been reunited, which is ironically, I think the thing they should have dragged out a little bit longer, these story, these episodes have felt not necessarily filler, but certainly what you said, we're only going to get this much more farther. So technically not necessarily filler, but also not necessarily exciting and moving. And, yeah, it's and, not and, filler and, because it is no. moving the plot forward. They just right. like to move one plot point forward at a time for some yeah. reason. Yeah. It's like they're playing chess, really slow chess. Uh, but I, but then again, I do, I've been enjoying this. I liked the episode, loved Asajj, loved what happened there, uh, loved her fights with the, with the clones. And then of course the conversation at the end. So I enjoyed the episode, but by the same token, I think Michael's right. I would have liked to have seen a bit more stuff moving forward. And at the end, a little conflict there. Because it felt like, oh yeah, well look, uh, Yoda's back or ba Grogu is back with the Mandalorian. I guess we're good. I guess we're good. You know, it felt like that again. You know? Yeah, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. I mean, I've made peace with the fact that I'm going to love Star Wars until I'm yeah. dead. Yeah. Like, there's Fair probably going to be a day down the road where I put Book of Boba Fett on for some reason. Oh, like, God. like, like I love Star Wars. Right. And so I will watch every episode of Bad Batch and I will go back and watch the episodes of Bad Batch that I like. And watching the episode with Asajj Ventress in it, mm. I am sure I'll rewatch it. Like, I'm yeah. sure I'll go back and watch it. So as a Star Wars fan, right. I can very much love and enjoy this show. But when I'm looking at all of the animated things, we, all of the geek things we watch, but all right. of even with even all the animated things we watch, when something has like they're just that story is kicking and every yeah. character has stuff going on and things are happening and i'm kind of left breathless at the end of 30 minutes because so much went on yeah. i get excited and with bad batch i kind of get to the end i'm like that was really pretty that was a very pretty episode it's kind of where i'm left it's just so pretty uh fair point michael fair point fair point um all right real quick uh pirates of the caribbean reboots that is what bruckheimer essentially intimated in a recent podcast are you excited about this he said that Depp will not be in the film, but he's looking forward to working with Depp down the road on something else. Your thoughts on this? I mean, Pirates is a great franchise. Yeah. Pirates is a great franchise. And because Disney has Pirates rides at every single one of their parks, yeah. it's a franchise that kids are constantly being introduced to yes. over and over and over again. So they did it once and they did it great. That version of it kind of got run into the ground. But I think that... With all of the other things that get rebooted, Pirates absolutely should get a reboot. I don't know what it'll be, um, but I think that Pirates absolutely, there's a lot of good storytelling in there. Yeah. There's also a lot of bad storytelling in there. So like, it's just like, I hope they get it right, but it's definitely something that could be great. Yeah, I, I think reboot's the way to go. 
Start it all over again. Start from scratch. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, look, Captain Jack Sparrow was great in his day. And yeah. it's cool that he's on the rides and the parks and he's a kind of like, like, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean for however many years until Black Pearl came out yeah. was just a ride with some random pirates on it. Right. And then what the movies did is they gave specific characters like Davy Jones, like Blackbeard, like Jack Sparrow, like Barbosa. They like they gave specific characters to the world of pirates, which is great. Right. But to go now and jump forward and say, okay, well, they were great for their time, but let's start fresh. Let's yeah. do totally new pirates. Let's yeah. do a totally new story, uh, I think is definitely the way to go. I don't think that anybody cares so strongly about Jack Sparrow at this point that you have to either have Johnny Depp come back or I also don't think you need to reboot it and cast somebody else's Jack Sparrow. I think yeah. you can just tell a brand new story with brand new pirates and everybody would be okay with it. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. I agree with you. I think people aren't that crazy about it not being Johnny Depp anymore. Uh, and I think that'll be, you open the door for it, for God's sakes. Um, let's see what else. One last thing. Oh, uh, how to train your dragon. Did you want to talk about that or Epic Adventure? Anything you want to say on these things? Yeah, you know, I mean, Epic Adventure is coming. It's the third park in Orlando for Universal, and they've been releasing a lot of videos to get people hyped. And, you know, we talked about the big video that they released a few, right. like a month or so ago, right. that kind of explained what all the different lands were going to be in Epic Adventure. Um, but you know, as, as an animation fan who really loves the how to train your dragon movies, like the how to train your dragon section was a park, a part of the park that I was really <laughs> interested in um so they've sort of revealed what all the rides are going to be in that area and so it's basically um there's sort of a a, a, a a younger age roller coaster where hiccup has sort of designed a dragon flyer and there's like a spinning dragon racer thing yeah there's one third ride and then there's going to be a there's a big uh dining area mm -hmm. and then there's a big theater that has a giant show where you get to see dragons in real life that i think is kind of based on the show that they have in beijing oh yeah um and it looks nice it looks yeah. really cool yeah. i think that you know and i said this on twitter um when you have pandora at animal kingdom just down the street um in orlando where you can literally do the avatar ride where you're like riding an ecron. Yeah. Um, the fact that they don't have a ride where it simulates you actually riding a dragon in the how to train your dragon section of Epic Adventure strikes me as kind of a miss. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you're not wrong in that criticism, brother. Because we see how these these rides are advancing. And so you've got to meet the needs. Once the bar is set by another company, you've got to meet that bar and go above it if you can, for sure. But who knows if it's a budgetary and plus they're, you know, they're putting what five new lands. So maybe they, there's limits on what they can create and space limits as well on what they can put up. But I agree with you, man. The, the dragon thing would have been awesome. It does. Seem, it seems ultimately like, like that. It seems ultimately yeah. like the how to train your dragon section of Epic Adventure is a. Oh, the, the show is apparently amazing if it's yeah. based on the Beijing show, but the rides themselves, it definitely seems like how to train your dragon is more of a kitty area yeah. than maybe I was expecting it to be. Which is a shame because they're about to do a live action version, which I think right. will appeal to adults and and uh, teenagers and kids. So uh, it's a shame for sure. Um, let's see. I think that was all the subjects. So let's hit some final super chats and get on out of here, Mike, because we're close to two hours anyway. So we all got to get on with our nights. Uh, let's see. Haunted underscore autumn says for the musical interludes. Bravo, Michael. Bravo. I mean, I appreciate that, but I don't know that I deserve two bravos from a musical interludes. I'll try and do better next time. I'm no Shannon McClung. Who is? Uh, Francisco Lopez says, my last question, are you going to do a spoiler review for the second half of Invincible next week? Well, I would love to, but certain somebody's out of town. You, I mean, you can either do it with Shannon, which I completely support because I will be out of town, or you can wait for me to come back and we can all talk Invincible. I am I good either way. I will definitely be watching them. So, yeah, Me too. I think we should wait, and we'll wait when you come back and we'll do a Geek Bites conversation because I, I like the season a lot. Um, Chuck Van says, uh, from Aussie, from Australia, love all the shows, the passion from Roca. And always find Vogel's takes insightful. Are you guys up to date on Invincible Season 2? Thoughts ahead of the season finale? Will you review it on the Geek Buddies? Well, we answered that one already about reviewing it. I am not caught up. I will be caught up by the time the season finale hits next week. Where are you at right now on this? Um, I'm almost caught up. I think I have like one episode to watch, but it's great. Yeah. yeah. It's great. I mean, it's just, yeah. you, you know, I do think that... Um, what I think is great about it is it feels like a lot. I, I know that for a lot of people who weren't, who hadn't read the comics, mm. that first half of season two felt a little bit um, disjointed. Yeah. 
you know, you got this story over here, you got the Martian story, you got, you know, uh, his dad on the planet with the, you're like, what? It's, it's so many different things. And it felt like it was jumping around a lot. And yeah. I think this back half of season two has been like, no, no, we know we, we had it. Like, we're good. We're, we're weaving it all back together. So it feels like season two as a whole is really doing the things that it had to do. And I just think it's great. I mean, I, as we were saying before, the more adult animation that's not just uh, Family Guy, Bob's Burgers, uh, right. you know, American Dad type of stuff. Like the fact that we have such a variety of adult animation and Invincible is particularly that we have these animated superhero, super violent mm. shows that are each one is at about, you know, between 40 minutes and an hour long. Um, that's different than everything else we have on yeah. TV right now. And so the more stuff we have like that, the more Invincibles and Arcanes and stuff like that, like, I think that the more that those do well, the more that streamers and networks are going to go, oh, yeah. adults really like this animation stuff. We should make more stuff for them. So the more of that, the better. I agree. That's a great point. hundred percent, hundred percent. Philly G says, uh, Philly G is sending a super sticker. Thank you, Philly G. Uh, you're awesome. You're awesome. All right, let's wrap it up there. Thanks to everybody who joined us tonight for this uh, another live episode, another live happy hour episode here on uh, the Geek Buddies. We appreciate it madly. Um, thanks for all the stream labs. Thanks for all the super chats. Thanks for the lively chat. Michael, uh, what do we have to tell the people who are watching today? Well, I think we have one more super chat that just came in. Oh, did it? Okay, sorry, I didn't see it. Oh, there we go. Uh, Fabrice says, how do you feel about Harloff not bothering watching Shogun, honestly. No, no, Harlov is not bothered. It's not that he's not bothering to. He wants to get around to it. But he's about to move to New York, everybody. So he's got a lot of shit going on where he's moving stuff around. He's got to put it all together. So he will get around to it. I know he will. And all of you who've been waiting for him to watch it, you're all going to pay attention at high numbers when he does his reviews. So, you know, he, he's going to he's gonna benefit from delaying watching it uh, uh, overall. So uh, it's not that he's not bothering. I think that's the wrong characterization, so. Um, all right, there we go. Michael, what do we have to tell our fans who are watching us right now? Well, thank you so much for watching. And we had a great time chatting with you and having some drinks and uh, having my computer almost explode. So it's been a <laughs> wild Geek Buddies. It's been super fun for everybody. Um, and if you would like to follow us, you can do so on Twitter at Geek underscore Buddies, on Instagram at The underscore Geek underscore Buddies. You can follow me at MKToon. You can follow Roka at The Roka Says. And after you do all that following, you can also smash that like button below, subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page, check out all the amazing content he's had. You guys were amazing in the live chat. If you are listening to this later, leave your comments below. What did you think of everything that we talked about? And should I buy a new computer? And what should I do in Japan? Let us know in the comments below. If you are listening to us on a podcast, go ahead and leave some stars and some comments so we go up in the rankings and more people can find us. And as always, the best thing you can do is retweet this video, post it on your socials, send it to your friends and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies. There you go. We've been having a blast. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Uh, and if you want to send some support to the show afterwards, now that we've finished going live, you can hit that super thanks button and send in some support that way as well. But yes, as Michael said, please patronize everything, subscribe. And if, if, and if you are listening to us on the podcast feed, please patronize the clients who sponsor our shows and, and allow us to do commercials for them on our shows. Better help. All these places there, they're really great there for to help you out in your life. So, uh, all right, thanks, guys. Take care of yourselves. A bon voyage to Michael heading off to Japan. Have a great trip with you and Brian Leonard. We will miss you. Uh, we'll hold the four down for 10 days, and then we'll be excited for when you come back, and we'll do some more Geek Buddies content with the trio reunited again. And we'll talk to you next time with another brand-new episode or live episode here of The Geek Buddies!